Welcome to the show, everyone. Welcome to Wrist Shot Week. I'm just checking to see if my laptop keeps up with the stream and we will get this thing going. Awesome. I can see a lot of you in the chat already. Welcome to the show. Oh, I've been a little bit waylaid, sorry, by about two or three minutes, but uh, I'm in the wings warming up, as Mark P says. It's great. Welcome, everyone. Thank you all for joining. It's a pleasure having you all here, and we're going to have a great time. Uh, the thinking was to continue the first attempt of Wrist Shot Week, except make it a little bit more official, and it seems like it's working. So I just want to say hi to everyone in the chat. There's a lot of names. Forbin Colossus, ID Klein, asking whether it's Omega or Omega. I, I really believe it is Omega, but that's how the that's how the Brits say it, at least. That's how we say it. Uh, Curtis, Williams Watches, uh, Don, no, sorry, D D Doman Integra, there's so many names. Neo, hi everyone. Uh, for the first time, surprisingly, can you all hear me okay? Let's start, uh, just um, comment one in the chat and let me know if you can hear me fine, if we can get the show rolling. For the first time, I actually managed to save all of your suggestions, um, sorry, all of your submissions, which is great. I quite literally spent the last, I don't know, the last half an hour getting it all compiled, loud and clear, superb. Thank you, everyone. I see lots of ones. Great. Evening from Wales. There's so many names. I can't even begin to start. Matthew from New Zealand, as always. Chili Badger. I have all of your submissions and something. Oh, it's going to be so good. Sweet. Okay. So to everyone who's new to the page and to the channel, I, I noticed that this series came out of nowhere. You won't believe over 100 people joined because of the last attempt at this, this wrist shot week show. And what I'll do, if you are catching up with the show, if you haven't seen it before, I will link in the corner of the screen uh, what the show is about. You'll be able to watch it after the, the live stream's over. But the thinking behind it all was, I can give you a brief summary, and it taught me quite a lot, that the whole idea of looking at each other's wristwatches taught me that there's such a greater depth to our hobby and how much further it goes. Instead of always being showed to and advertised to about what is popular, uh, what is liked by the majority, actually seeing how individualistic we all are and what we enjoy says more about anything else. And the thinking was, you know, instead of just advertising watches like we generally do, I think the idea of seeing uh, what people have and their separate tastes, it's so much more important. We learn, we learn a lot doing this and it should be great. So I will get to the watches right now. Actually, I'm going to pull them up because there are many. Uh, last week I had 50 emails and a concurrent week straight after the first show. Uh, I, I would say I received at least 100, 100 emails. There are a lot of watches to go through and I, I really hope you enjoy it because the variety is insane. You're going to be seeing everything from entry level, horturology, steel, gold, dress watches, sports watches, the whole deal. I would also like to add, this is the watch I'm wearing tonight. We'll get into that in a second. I would also like to add that the weather is the one thing I can't control. <laughs> and I noticed that the last stream, there was a bit of a cutout segment here and there. So I don't know what it's going to be like tonight because uh, there's heavy wind on the South Coast. Uh, like Nine Bolt says, from a, a wet and windy London, it's very bad in the South Coast as well. So if the signal does break, please uh, just, just bear with me as we get through it. But there are lots. If you look to the left of your screen right now, you will see me scrolling through the submissions that came in. And that table of contents is there to help guide me through the many watches that are on show. As you can see, there are lots. And I go in and I have to affiliate, assign the person's name and the reference of the watch to it. And uh, it's a long process, but it's so rewarding. Honestly, I don't even know what's going to be on show because it's it's a quick process, me saving. And again, I cannot thank you all enough for submitting these pieces because, like I said, the first time around, the first episode of the series, uh, it was almost as if you were in cahoots with each other, <laughs> that the watches were so varied and diverse. You all knew what to submit and what not to submit, and it's just great. We're going to have a cool time. So... Jeez, there's so many names. Thomas Burnett, great to have you here, brother. I hope you're feeling better. I hope you're drinking lots of fluids. I think you got my email. Watches and giggles. Uh, very interesting video that you that you sent out on the authorized dealer story. And yeah, it seems like the, the video that I put out like a day ago, looking at the, the information and coming up with some renders seemed to have made people a bit angry. But hey, 
Uh, it was a lot of fun. I love rendering and stuff. Dear Artifact, welcome. There are so many of your names, and it's a pleasure. I'm going to try my absolute best to keep up with all of you in the chat, but this is more of a presentation than anything else. So please uh, forgive me <laughs> if I go on tirades and, and rants and talks. If you'd like to get my attention in the chat, uh, tag me at IDGuy, and I'll see it a lot faster. It comes up in orange on my screen. So uh, like watches and giggles, that's no, a pleasure. Absolute pleasure. I uh, see Clive has joined us, Mark P. And speaking of which, Mark P, you're first on the list this evening or this morning, wherever you are in the world, because of the watch that you picked up this week. So let's begin. Uh, this is going to be a long show. I don't have a live five, which is what normally begins the shows, because there's just so many watches on show already. And uh, yeah, it's going to be a long one. But the watch is at hand, just terrific. So let's start. This piece is called a Chronotac Explorer. And I put it up on Instagram today. And there was a very interesting comment left saying that this watch is more legend than real at this point. They actually are very hard to, to find, believe it or not. And I just absolutely love it. I've got two of these. And I plan on finding a Swiss ETA for it. It's an homage of a 1655 Explorer II. Uh, and you will see a near perfect condition, new old stock variant of a 1655 later on in the show. Uh, but I just dig it so much. And then I did an offset angle just to see that acrylic crystal. There's nothing cooler than acrylic. And what's cool about it, what I enjoy about the watch, it's not a literal translation. You don't see Rolex anywhere on the dial. You can get away with a watch like this because no one knows what a 1655 is, right? Uh, unless you are in this hobby and you, you know something about Rolex watches and 70s pieces. I really dig the idea that it has a broad arrow hand and that there's a T for tritium, chronotac automatic. It's, it's a really nice layout. It's cool. I enjoy wearing it a lot. And this was me finishing the last of my, uh, my paraffin, my dregs of my paraffin earlier. It's a really sick piece. I just, I wear it, throw it around, use it. And speaking of which, end of this year, I have a watch purchase coming, first luxury watch purchase. And I look forward to sharing it with all of you. I'm very excited. I know what the watch is and uh, it'll mean a lot. It'll mean a lot just uh, as a acquirement, as something to be worked towards. I quite literally to told myself and stopped myself from buying it last night. I was right on the edge, you know, that final click. And I said, no, hold out. You're probably going to need this money this year. So yeah, that's, uh, that's what I've been doing. Anyway, it's a beautiful watch and the acrylic crystal, I will say, something about acrylic, it just makes the dial so much more visible. You notice that you barely see any glare on it at, at most. When you when you view it at an offset angle, uh, you cannot see that there is crystal there. And it's beautiful. I didn't get a good enough angle to show you the high top plexi, but it's just great. I really enjoy it. It's an awesome watch. Okay, we're going to get into the show, and I need to get to the chats. But first, Mark P., congratulations, sir picked up a 116520 Daytona this week, and it is stellar. He's been asking a lot of us our opinions and what he should, have, uh, what he should get. There's a couple of us in the, in the Instagram community. Highly suggest if you have Instagram, get onto it because the watches, the inspiration, you know, from, again, personal collections, seeing what people have to offer shows you a lot. They share a lot of great things with all of us. And as, as I go through, there are a few people here that I'll be shouting out, putting their Instagram handles in the chat. So yeah, congratulations, Mark. It is a beautiful watch. It is stellar. If you'd like to give us more details in the chat, by all means, uh, you know, the, the, I don't know how old this piece is, if it's a uh, you know, mid-2015 or anywhere else. Okay, I'm going to try my best again. Like I said, it's going to be like a lecture today, but... Yeah, all I can say is stick around. There are many watches on show, and I think you will enjoy it as it goes through. Uh, James, welcome. Great having you here. Pilot Style, Julie, uh, Chili Badger, Ant, awesome having you here. Many of you people have sent in your watches to the show, and it's going to be so good seeing what you have to offer us. I can't remember the order. Oh, and Zane's asking what my email is. If you look at the, uh, if you look at the description of this video, you click the little drop down of the video, you will see it. And another thing I should add, I didn't even begin the show by crediting David for his submission of a Mark II Speedmaster, the watch that you saw on the cover photo of this video. It is absolutely beautiful. You will see it in a second. He took it while on a ski slope, and 
it looks just insane. It was, and you know, my thinking is the best, the best wrist shot that I receive when we do this show. Um, I plan on sending you a private email asking your permission if it can be used for the cover photo so we can all appreciate it. And I think that'll again, just once again, share what everyone else has. And it's, it's nice. It's a community thing. Mark P says it's a 2012 piece. Awesome. And he sent me another one. Let's have a better look at this. So I've asked him what he thinks about it. You know, a Daytona is an, you know, a piece that many aspire to own. And I'm so glad that how you, how you can start a, a hobby and get to a point. I mean, for many, this is the end all be all. This is the grail, the final, how do you get this mouse out of the way? There we go. This is the final watch that you get to cap off a collection, you know? And it's amazing seeing just how you start somewhere and end at a point like this. And I really like this over the ceramic. The black ceramic, as you, you'll see at a later stage, it looks beautiful, but considering the price that, that's asked for that watch compared to this with a steel bezel, and it's more understated, I would say. Uh, of course, legibility, that's all up to you, whether you can read it well enough or not. The one complaint I've always had with these modern Daytonas, sorry, Mark, I'm going to rip into your Daytona briefly. Uh, the Zenith Daytonas knew how to arrange their subdials. Everything was symmetrical and balanced. And you notice here, if you just draw your eye across the center of the dial, you notice how these hands are pushed up ever so slightly. And the whole, the whole subdial segment seems to be raised. And I think that has to do with Rolex's movement. When it was introduced, uh, these dials were made to be pushed slightly upwards. Uh, it's, it's not an appealing look to me personally, but it's a Daytona. And what can you say? I just hold it on this for a bit longer. And yeah, I'm warming up with a coffee, I'm not drinking any alcohol tonight, so bear with me. Is there a topic for the show or is it a wrist shot show? Christopher Pedersen says, this is purely a wrist shot show tonight. And the idea is maybe twice, twice a month we'd run this, where you send in your submissions, I share them with all of us. Uh, come next week and the week after, I plan on a subject related show which we will be continuing, don't worry. It's just this weekend, I want to cement this concept for everyone to have a look. And yeah, I hope, I hope you enjoy it as we get through this. Okay, many more names. And again, if I don't shout you out, it's not because I'm ignoring you, it's just difficult to catch up. Ryan from the Netherlands, welcome, sir. Uh, let's see, Tippy, great to have you here. Tippy, you've sent some watches in, we look forward to looking at those. Mr. Chapman, awesome. The Common Fowl, awesome, from Singapore, welcome. That is so cool. Okay, so Mark P, congratulations, sir, on the Daytona. And then we move through, so now we start with A. Your name will be mentioned alphabetically, so if your name did start with a Z, then <laughs> I apologies, you will be last on the stream, but we will get there eventually. Starting off slowly, this is from Eric. It's an Amiga Speedmaster and his wife's ladies Prince date. Actually, it's not a ladies, it's a 36 mil. But it's really, I love the salmon dial on this piece. It looks gorgeous. So thank you. And I really like this idea, this his and hers idea. Really nice way of just that extra added community touch, family spirit. And you don't see these Speedmasters around often. Automatic. I'm guessing it's a coaxial. You might have to correct me in that area. Uh, interesting. There's a, a question from, from Der Bar Marg. Again, if you would, uh, to catch my attention quickly, tag me at IDGuy in the chat. I'll be able to see it a lot faster. If I have to scroll through it, odds are, uh, scroll through the chat, odds are I might miss some of your questions. Do I believe in the concept of a one watch? I think we all do. I think any of us in the community, this, this whole watch space, we all aspire. It's like, it's like the, the Nirvana because oh, there's just something about it. So this is gorgeous. I'll, I'll get to that question now. Great question. Uh, if it is a coaxial, I should say coaxial, Tippy says. Really interesting arrangement. You don't you, you very seldomly see subdials arranged, this three, three section layout. Nice use of the date integration there, red highlights. Has that Newman Daytona vibe. There are a few more. There's there's a certain variant of the Speedmaster that has this Newman-esque element to it. And Tudor Prince Date. I talk about an affordable date just. Tudor princes in general, they're really good value for money that we can get out there. So really nice, and I like this, again, I'll emphasize, I like this idea of the family coming together with their two watches. I think it's really nice. Okay, on to Andy. 
Hamilton car key, plain and simple. Whoops. Oh, no. And your watch is coming up. I'm just warming up my mouse hand, as always. So um, question about the one watch thing. It's a great question. It's, it's the thing that we all strive for, most of us at least. It's that nirvana where you think... Um, you think you can reach it one day. It's an aspiration in a sense. I, I really do like that idea because I, life, life should be about, what did Einstein say about life? A quiet life without unrest is a happy life. Something, something like that. I can't remember his, um, his quote. It was a brilliant quote though. If anyone knows it, please mention it in the comments. Something like, a life is better lived without strife or unrest. A simple life. And we could, we could translate that into our watches in a way, not having to worry about a choice so much. You have one watch, you've worn it for X amount of years. Speaking of which, Curtis, Curtis in the chat, I really hope your wife is okay and she's recovering. He sent in a gorgeous watch. We'll be seeing it very soon. His name is C, so we'll see it quickly. A 36-year-old GMT. He's been wearing it for 36 years and... Yeah, it's it's really nice. There's something about it, that that character, that history, that life. You know, it's an aspirational thing for most of us. But you know, the the thing is, in a world something about monogamous, <laughs> you know, in a world where there's so much variety, so much consumerism, so much availability for things, we often uh, lose touch and we go a little bit excessive at times, especially when a hobby like watches. Partly, it's a time when we get to show off what we have. Whether that's a good thing, it's a bad thing. I don't know. We can see it both ways. There are things to aspire towards. They are very much things that we buy to appreciate what we've done, how we've gotten there. At the same time, channels like you know, watch channels in general can be very show offish with what they have. And uh, yeah, it's, it's divided. Great question, though. I love I love questions that ask those kinds of you know diverse. Uh, Andreas Giorgio from Cyprus. I've been to Cyprus. Beautiful part of the world. Love it. Uh, kind of Paul Newman Seamaster, Mr. Chapman. Yeah, that was my, my line. Okay. Dylan asking, hope mine made the cut. I really hope so. <laughs> I, I stopped the submissions an hour before the show. But there are so many. Look to the left of the screen and you'll notice just the sheer amount of watches on show. There's, there's a lot. Okay. Cheers from Chicago. Robert, thank you. Uh, Julie, uh, so many. Okay, okay. Now the problem is when I ask you to tag me in the chat, so I get like 50 of them and I can't keep up. Okay, so beautiful watch. This Hamilton Kaki, we all enjoy. It's, it's a field watch. There's something about military and field watch that appeals to all of us. The idea of olive drab as well, faux patina. I think there is another Hamilton that's going to be coming up later. I can't remember. Um, okay, so... This is awesome. Uh, love the variety of life. Cannot fathom having only one watch. That's that's the thing, but Doc Baps. Uh, there is so much variety. It's, and the thing is, the deeper you go into this hobby, the more you want to explore and experiment and see what is out there. This watch, oh, geez, I've got to get used to this mouse. Ant G, who is in the chat, this is his birth year, 5512, and it looks brand new. It is beautiful. So, Ant, if you're there, welcome. I really, really love your watch. I think you said it was from 1983. I think. Do not know. Can't remember. Again, it's very difficult to keep track of everything. But Ant has an amazing collection. He's asked me to do a review of it one day. And I cannot wait to get to it eventually. Time is of the essence. 78, 5513. Superb. Okay. It's gorgeous. And the crown, the patina. I think the patina is what really grabs us. It looks like it has some serifs to the, to the batons, which was one of the elements that made it unique. Me and dial numbers, I don't ask me. Me and like knowing Mark 1s, Mark 2s, Mark 4s, no idea. But it's just, it's stellar. It's something about a vintage sub that will never get old. You know, it's just great. Okay, Freddie Turner, I have seen, I've seen many of your photos. You've got them all here saved. Don't worry. Uh, we will get to them eventually as well. Some of the late submissions that I didn't get to at the end of the last stream, I've saved them in here as well. So we've got tons of variety to look at. Next, this is from Arilyn. I hope I really got your name right. A Cellini date from Rolex. You very seldomly see this watch in such direct lighting. And I've said that the Cellini 
is one of those watches that really, when you think about Rolex, you don't think Cellini. Nowadays, you think oyster, you think diving, you think water. So for a brand to bring out a dress watch, just to say, hey, guys, we know what we're doing. I think uh, something special, something unique. <laughs> Watches and giggles. Wow, someone bought one. Yeah, uh, I don't know the story behind it exactly, uh, but this was sent from Arilin, one of his pieces. And talking about the design of the watch, the, the way the dial has been arranged with the batons placed, if we notice the hands, how they, how the minute hand reaches the minute track on the dial. I hope you can see this okay. How the hour hand just touches the batons. Very interesting use of space. And I don't know the dimensions of this watch. Is it about 39 mils? Uh, very nice allocation to all the elements. And just the finishing, you know, the, the fluting that's followed all through the, the case through the dial, apologies. Very, very light fluting around the bezel, very understated. But of course, it is a very, you know, when you see it in this kind of light, it stands out well. Um, so it's it's nice, dig it. And the next piece I submitted was a Glashütte original, and the model is Sport, oh dear, will I be able to see it? Sport Evolution, okay, cool. I've got to try and like keep track of all these names. Sport Evolution. Can't say I know much about this piece. Chronograph, very 70s inspired when we look at the batons. Notice the date window at the four o'clock position. It's one of the elements that I really like about Glossuta is that they, they seem to follow through a lot with the way they place their dates. And I, I like that positioning, actually. Uh, instead of the, the three o'clock, which cuts off the use of this baton, having it a little bit offset and a large date window at that, great, looks superb. Okay, this is this is also a GMT. Wow. So it's a what is it, man? I can't I can't even it's a GMT. Separate GMT, it's not a chronograph. Apologies. Uh, like I said, when there's a hundred images coming in, <laughs> I seldom take the time to sit and look at everything as it comes. It's it's name and save, name and save. We can all get in and enjoy. Okay. Uh, awesome. So Robert, Robert, that's you. Okay, awesome. Superb. <laughs> We're getting there eventually. Uh, your chats again. I'm trying to keep up. Uh, Blitz Lizard. I saw you were from Australia. Welcome. Must be very early in the morning for you there right now. Adam, welcome. It's just cool. The Cellini again. Talking about the Cellini. It's one of those watches that seems to uh, really go under the radar. Many people don't don't see it, don't look at it much. But it is one of those pieces that is. Very unique to the brand, considering that they are all about sports watches at this point in time. Uh, it's peculiar. It's peculiar how brands go through their ebbs and flows and change over life. Okay, next, Cedar Canoe. Is Cedar Canoe? Ryan's asking me, do I have wine today? No, I have a double shot of coffee, and that's me. Coffee and water. I'm uh, keeping myself a sober cobra today. Cedar Canoe, Seiko Speed Timer. From the 1970s and this was awesome this was sent in today and uh, really dig it it's so 70s you can't even begin you know a uh, bullhead chronograph brown accents caramel that looks great tropical dial you don't see these watches anymore you know uh, it's just clean clean all the way through the way they arrange their sub dials just baffles me uh, back in the day with, with those square square plots they really wanted to take the, the motor influences to heart and really try and incorporate it in some way or another. Uh, you know, even going so far, emulating the brown, the wood grain effect, dashboard, this looks like it could have been a cluster from inside of a dial looking at your fuel gauge or, you know, crazy. Uh, what's the question? Call it a maple syrup, Dylan says. Yeah, that's great. Uh, I really like it. This, the size, the presence, it's a real chronograph for sure. It's a really nice watch. Again, like I said, the variety here is insane. We're going to be seeing everything from modern to vintage all the way through. And uh, highly suggest you stick around because we have, I don't even know where to begin, Pateks, Doxes, vintage modern subs and GMTs. I can't even keep track. Next, another one from Cedar Canoe. And this is another Seiko chronograph. I didn't get the name of this watch, but again, same format, different dial placement. You actually notice that the sub dials are exactly the same. It's just these, you know, it's just been arranged horizontally and vertically. How cool is that? 
don't even notice that until you take a good look. Lovely white highlights. There's something about these white hands that was used with the seven, any, any 70s reference. Amazing how legible it makes the watch. Even if you don't have loom on the piece, you can see it in the dark. And that's special. I mean, talking about this little chrono tack that I wear, you don't need loom on the watch because even in the darkest of spots, you can still see the time easily. It's interesting that brands don't incorporate white hands anymore with their pieces. It's almost like that, that whole aesthetic died with the 70s era watches. Crazy, right? Very strange how, how the industry changes again, how, how design influences change. If we look at the automotive industry and everything else. Next, this is from Chris. We watch guy, Wisconsin watch guy, I'm guessing. Uh, he's normally in the chats. And like I said, black ceramic Daytona. Mm, I love this shot. It's such a beautiful, nothing better than a high res shot of a watch with lots of detail because then you just get to see everything. And what I love the most about it is that it's worn on a right wrist. Uh, it goes to show that there are a few left handers out there. So mm, I just love it. Uh, Mr. C. Thank you so, so much for the super chat. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I love it. This whole, this whole channel and what we do, what we get to enjoy, it's, it's always been a hobby. This will always be a hobby for the rest of my life. But the fact that it's actually starting to make me money, um, I'm actually going to be writing articles for Craft and Tailored very soon and getting myself out there a bit more. It's, it's so much fun doing this. Uh, you wake up every day doing something that you enjoy, and there's nothing really better than that, you know? Uh, so Dylan Lamb saying the chrono dials look like 70s TV. Very well said. And uh, excuse me if I am very slow. I am still warming myself up ever so slightly. And uh, if I'm not too witty and sharp with my remarks on the watches, that is just because uh, we've been doing this for, she's 26 minutes already. <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, now how it goes. Um, let's see, dear artifact, welcome. You're very soon. You're going to be up next. Um, it's like a virtual red bar. Well said. And dear artifact, once I mention you, I will put your Instagram tag on. Everyone, get onto Instagram and follow dear artifact. Has a superb tight knit collection. Highly suggest you have a look at his stuff. Beautiful photos as well, as you will see in a second. Um, and Judy Hill saying love craft and tailored. Yeah, I think they're great. Cam is such an excellent guy. Um, I really look forward to doing some work with him, meeting him again and getting out there, looking at the watches. I mean, he deals with some amazing, amazing watches and amazing people and uh, the stories that he can tell. Mm. So getting back to the Ceramic Daytona, the hype, yes, it's ridiculous. In a way, I said that to Mark when Mark asked my, uh, my opinion on whether he should get a Daytona or not. And I said, you know, the Daytonas are just hype machines, uh, whether or not they'll hold their value open to interpretation. I'm not someone to ask that question, um, but it is a beautiful watch. It's a functional instrument. The, the Black Daytona has seen a lot of uh, interesting news headlines <laughs> over the, the past few months. Um, what can you say about it? It's what I like the most about the watch actually is that it really can be your one watch. There, there are very few that you could say falls into that category. This one especially, the fact that it has screw down crowns and pushes and uh, ceramic bezel to take a knock. You could use this every day, smash it around. You could use this thing hard. The idea with, with Rolex watches in general, most sports watches nowadays, we forget that the technology behind watchmaking has changed so drastically over the years. Most watches you can use 10 times harder than you are currently using them. Uh, and for a watch like this, Rolex tends to incrementally improve their pieces and really focus in on making them more and more hardy. What I don't understand is why they still have sapphire crystals that jut out of their, <laughs> out of the bodies of the watches, but that's just me. Beautiful photo, beautiful watch. Love the fact that it's on a right wrist. It's nice seeing that for a change. Now we get to the next and there's so many. Justin, welcome to the show. Orange Hand, you've got some beautiful photos that are gonna be coming up just now. Rob Smith, thank you so, so much for the super chat. I, I cannot thank you all enough for joining and for sending all of these watches in. That's the best part. The, the idea, what I like so much about it is that your submissions becomes our joy, our pleasure, getting to see all of these things, the sheer variety of thought. So this was, this was cool. The, the remark made when this was sent to me was, I bought this Blancpain 
after your video. I made a video looking at the 50 fathoms, the aqualung, and uh, 50 fathoms, bathyscaphe, and the aqualung. And this is the Putin watch, many people call it. And you can see it side by side with a, this looks to be a last series, a 114270 Explorer. Correct me if I'm wrong. 36 mil. I hope I'm, I can see that the case looks like it's a 36 mil. But uh, something about this piece with the big date, let's get some good zoom in quality right there. I love the fact, this watch is it's rare actually, hard to find. Uh, they came out in the early 2000s, I'd say about 2004. And I think there's something so unique about a big date that's hidden at the base of the dial. You wouldn't even see it. And I love the fact that this is a comparison between an Explorer and the Aqualung. Because you get to see the, the sharing of the numerals. You notice how the numerals are very similar between the, the three and the nine. They both have that curve to them. Uh, Rolex seems to stretch themselves out a little bit. I don't know if I'm so much of a fan of Rolex's use of numerals on these, these modern explorers. Uh, I've, I've said, like in the, if you saw yesterday's, was it yesterday? Thursday's video about uh, Basel World. That's another story being closed and everything. Um, I, I tried to put a 1016 dial on a modern Explorer and it looked so beautiful. Okay, uh, watches and giggles. That's my Explorer, can't wait. Yeah, it's cool. I, is this, I'm, I'm assuming, I'm assuming, this is a 39 mil. What am I saying? Wake up, man. Sorry, everyone. It's a Saturday. I take a day off from watches on a Saturday if I can. Uh, this is definitely a 39. When you look at the, the, the loom on the, on the numerals, it's a gorgeous watch, though. It's stunning. And it makes my life so difficult because I've really been edging towards getting myself a 39 mil Explorer. But I want something a little less generic, if you know what I mean. And uh, yeah, I look forward to sharing it with all of you when the day comes. Uh, Blue Shirt, welcome. Welcome to the show. I just saw your comment. Dear Artifacts, got lots of names. Chris, welcome. I haven't seen you earlier. Um, any more names that I've missed out? Probably. Watch and pray. Date window is polarizing on the Blanc Pond. You think so? I think it is handled really well. The idea that the window is actually black, matches the dial, that you can't really see it. I guess the one thing that's quite dividing is that when you have a single digit on the date, it'll look strange, right? So you have zero, one, zero, two, even it might just be blank. And then you have an offset one on the right hand side. That would look peculiar. Very good point, actually. Uh, you know, you'd have this, this strange offset baton almost at, at a glance. Great submission though. It's so nice seeing these two side by side. We never see these two watches share the same airtime. And I think it's cool. Again, this, this Aqualung is rare. So uh, it's nice seeing that that mix of the two. Of the two, it's difficult to decide which is which is cooler and which is not because the Blanc Pan is very rare, sought after, understated, really understated. I love the hands. I love those sword hands on the watch. But the Explorer, that triangle at the 12 is what does it for me the most. I think it just, it sings. Centers your eye, centers the dial, you know? Gorgeous. Thank you so much for that submission, Chris. And there's another one. Oh, awesome. Okay. Getting to some loom. And there's your difference in loom shots and colors. Uh, there's a few loom. I think there's a great loom shot from, from David Coffey that we will see just now. He's also normally in the, in the chat of the show. Okay. 39 Explorer really does grow on you, nine bolts. Yeah, I agree. I think it does. And going back to that question, that point of one watch, you know, it would be so nice to say, this is my one watch. I've worn it for X amount of years. As Curtis said, we will be getting to his watch in a second, very soon. He's actually three three people down. He's He wore a GMT Pepsi for 32 years, one watch, while he was in service, while he was, uh, he was a pilot in the military, while he was actually working as a pilot, while he still works as a pilot. And uh, he just bought some bigger pieces because his eyes were going, but I uh, can't get enough of the chromolite, dear artifact says. Oh, it's so nice. Loom goodness. It's nice seeing the difference. I have never seen the Aqualung loom. It's, it's very much like a teal, where the chromolite is a much darker, richer hue. And I uh, said this in the first stream, that the, the, the blue of the chromolite, the idea behind blue loom is that uh, the light spectrum doesn't get, doesn't get affected as much when you're at depth. Blue light is, is one of the last lights that you see at depth. Uh, next to green, it disappears quite quickly. Interesting though, really like it. Thank you so much for this submission, Chris. Next from Colin. Now, this is quite a mind blow. 
he just sent me this. This is a 6263. I hope. I'm so bad with my Daytona references. <laughs> but this watch looks brand spanking new. It's a Rolex Oyster Cosmograph. Notice there's no Daytona on the dial. They were going through all sorts of chops and changes back in the day. Uh, but look how clean this watch is. Look at the case, the edges of the case, just at the top and the sides. This watch looks brand new. I'm just checking out the loom. It looks like it's missing one loom plot at the three o'clock. Nothing else on the dial. It is schmicko spotless. That is awesome. So nice. It's so nice seeing a vintage watch that looks brand spanking new, completely unworn, you know? Uh, and I love this dial. The, the Not the the black on black but the idea of having this white the legibility is just great you can see the time uh you can see that the, the separate sub dials at a glance so easily for the sake of function for the sake of using it as a timing instrument that's what you want and uh you know vintage watches knew what they were doing back back in the day brands understood the idea with legibility now it seems like fashion is a great focus and what i'll do is i'll go from this since we are so close Go from this piece back up to the ceramic and notice the difference in that sheer contrast when you look at the sub dials and the dial. Ready? One, two, three. You notice how it's almost as if watches nowadays chronograph. This, this chronograph, especially, I think of the Rolex Daytona now to be a fashion instrument more than a function instrument. You know, it's, it's used more as something to be worn as a piece of jewelry, a luxury piece of jewelry, where we scroll down to one of these pieces, much more of a tool aesthetic. Um, as we know, these watches were originally produced to be tools worn by those who were, whether they were flying or driving or in you know, a cosmograph, we we're about to go into space, but we never made the cut. Apologies, Rolex, sorry about that, guys. So, let's see what else is going on here. Again, I've missed all of your chats um the daytona cosmograph might be a safe queen dot bat that Daytona it must be it has to be i mean it's it's completely scratchless uh, it must have been worn a couple of times you can see on the bezel in a few places if we move up close we see a few my that could be fingerprints a few micro scratches but this watch looks absolutely brand new it's amazing seeing them in this kind of condition so thank you so much for sending this colin and last week i don't know if the man is in the chats but clyde watch wrangler who picked up a moser Center, not a center seconds, sub seconds. I'm, so, I'm useless with my reference numbers at most. Um, gorgeous looking watch. Great to see that he's diversifying and going out to have a look at other pieces. He sent this in last week. This was the week he picked it up. And now I can actually give it some time because a lot of these watches came in like five minutes before the show started and I was struggling. But Owen says small seconds. Okay, great. Um, don't ask me about the movement, me and movements, that side of things I am useless at. Slowly but surely learning over time. It's it's that acquired taste that you get eventually, but it is beautiful. I think the size, something stellar. There's been a lot of talk about this watch, so I won't uh, hang around on it for long. The the leaf hands, unique, interesting. Moser does some great stuff. I think their Fume dials really, really gets me the most. I think Fume on their, their pieces are just gorgeous. Next, this is to Curtis. Okay. Curtis sent me this. He was one of the last submissions today. And this is his 1675 from, he's been wearing it for 36 years. So that makes it, what, 1980, 1984? He's been wearing this watch all the way through. And I think there's something so stellar about that. He has picked up more watches. He's a commercial pilot. I'm sure now you can tell. But, uh, he has bought some more watches ever since, getting into the hobby a bit more. But this watch has been his one watch. He bought this when he was in the military, worn it ever since. And uh, he's now slowly but surely gotten to bigger watches over time, but he still loves wearing it. Uh, the value of this thing, sentimentally, don't think you can, you can ever replace a watch like this. So Curtis, if you're in the chat, that is just cool. And it's a great picture, right? I just love, I love a little bit of context in the background. It's so nice seeing. Uh, this is his favorite plane, I think he told me. I couldn't put all the details down on the on the list, on this table of contents, but this is the, his favorite plane that he fries. It's not, a, it's not an A380. Don't crucify me. I don't know my planes. Seven, seven, four, no, seven, four, seven. Yeah, 
don't even ask me about planes. Me and me and flying. Seven five seven. Dylan Lamb says, "Great, thank you for that." I hope that's right. <laughs> uh, and dear artifacts saying, "Love faded GMT bezels." There's something special, yeah. Right, going this this beautiful peach. What would you call it? Peach rose pink. Something else. And it's a 1675. Makes it. Oh, I love it. Great story. 1675s have quite a place in my heart. I think that was the real GMT reference that defined. Oh, getting ahead of ourselves here. That's the GMT reference that really defined itself. The small little touches that this watch had, like the way the bezel was done, very flat, uh, the, the profile. There's now talk about playing 777. Okay. <laughs> it's a 777, not a 757. Okay. Got it. Got it. Thank you, everyone. See, it helps when there's like, there's 200 people watching and commenting. So we get to learn these little bits and pieces on the side. Yeah. So it's great. I love the story uh, of all the watches that he has in his collection. He shared his collection with me. He has a Sky Dweller that he just picked up, the two-tone Sky Dweller, I think, and he loves it. He uses that practically all the time when he travels, flying all over the world. But I love the story behind this. You very seldom hear a story, 36 years of wear, and you know it's been his one watch all the way through. So if someone, whoever asked me that question in the beginning, I think, uh, yeah, this is, this is one of those stories. It shows it can be done, and look at it all the character from years gone by. This is from David Coffey, David C. He often is in the chat. He's often watching the shows. And another loom shot. Last week, he submitted a loom shot of his root beer, his CHNR. This week, it's the Seamaster 300. Love that. I think something about the Seamaster that I love is that blue, blue loom mixed with the, the green. It's nice seeing that contrast. And it makes the idea of using the bezel a little bit easier since you're matching the minute hand with the bezel pip. That's the idea, at least. Curtis saying it's a 1983. Oh, apologies, Curtis. So it's a 16750. Okay, just getting back to this again. It's generation one above the 1675. Uh, 16750 from 1983. I was close. Got, you know, a guy I can try. Beautiful loom shot that I love this. Uh, the presence, it's great. These watches seem to get, they're quite polarizing in the community. It was Omega's way of trying to call back to their original dive watch of the time. And I think they did a great job. Some people can't pull the presence off, I think. And there's a few little awkward things about this, this watch, like the lug width is 21 mils, which is difficult. Um, anyway, catching up with all of you here, I see a few comments. Uh, there's a question about reviewing the Glasuta CQ panorama date. It's from Rodrigo. I do need to look at Glasuta more, absolutely. Uh, I try, I, I'm trying my best to like branch out as much as possible. You'll notice over the next few weeks, I have a, a video on Zodiac that I've done, a video on the Longines Heritage Classic that I've done with a bit of Omega and Rolex peppering in between. I like to try and balance it out that way. I want to get into more Seiko, do some more Seiko write-ups. So yeah, uh, the thing is I can only put out two videos a week at a max because it's difficult you know it takes it takes hours to prepare these things <laughs> whether it's writing whether it's the idea of recording and hoping that everything's okay whether you feel inspired enough to sit down and do it all those little aspects play in the role of preparing these things and uh, just the editing alone is a good two hours worth of time it's insane you, you seldom you don't actually realize just how much time goes into the work uh, to make an eight minute video it's a joke uh, you'd think you would think it would earn you a lot more money, but hey, that's it. Uh, what else is going on here? Just catching up with all of you here. Tippy saying, what is a luxury watch pricing for me? Good question, Tippy. I've been studying up on that actually, because for the first time, I now have enough money to afford a luxury watch. And I would say luxury starts at, uh, at four figures. I would say a thousand and up. We're starting to get, actually, no, uh, what would I say? 2000 and up, I think we're starting to get into the luxury segment. Um, but it's all, you know, it's it's really all dependent on you. I would say luxury more more falls into the line of the movement of the watch you're getting, not so much the build. You can get extremely well built watches for five hundred bucks. So, uh, you know, luxury luxury for me, I think, has to do partly with the name, getting a brand like Omega or Rolex or you know Blancpain or whatever else, and I think the price bracket needs to be slightly over what you would spend average so my thinking general a thousand is is pretty is pretty understandable 
I would say falling into that 2000 category and luxury having it has to hurt as BS says, very good point. Uh, luxury watch should be something that, that kicks you in the stomach or in the groin for guys. It has to kick you in the nuts and you have to kind of, you know, for the first month, at least make sure you don't take it out into sunlight, you know, keep it, keep it in good Nick. Uh, Neville, welcome to the show. Mason, good seeing you here. I don't think I've seen you earlier. Forbin, I think I said hi to you. Welcome. Uh, Dylan, there's talk about Curtis's plane that he flies. Yeah, it's awesome. It's so nice having, what I also love is the, the variety of careers that everyone's uh, involved with, have pilots on. We have a, an ex-Marine on the show as well. Uh, I think he was part of the Airborne Battalion, which is great. Okay, let's see what else is going on. When I was a freshman in college, 400 euros was luxury to me. And that's it. I mean, 400 euros, it's a lot of money. This, this hobby that we're in, it's no small feat. I am, uh, I'm not, I will say this straight up that I can't afford a luxury watch at this point in my life. I've got way too many things. I mean, I'm putting a bond down for a house this year and there's no way I would be able to afford a watch. Not, not that I can't, but uh, priorities. And that's something you should really consider. It's, it's nice seeing these things. It's nice having them on tap. I think it's great, but you must also say to yourself, it's, there's a time and a place. <laughs> time and a place get it uh at this point in my life after going through university paying those fees don't get me started with that uh there's so much that that has to be paid on the the wayside as well so my hope my dream at the end of this year 2020 i buy my first luxury watch that's a real impactful piece that really hits me because uh yeah i've been writing about these things for so long that you really start forming attachments but you also learn about watches that you like, what you don't like. Using this platform, you get to see what's cliche, what's not cliche, so on, so forth. David, thank you so much. This is from David Coffey. Thank you so much for submitting your Seamaster. I love, I love the colors. And uh, there was there was mention about, oops, Magic Mouse working here. There was mention about the, the Loom being different colors. It's one of those things that makes Omega unique in their lineup. This is also from David. We've got a few Davids. We've got a few Johns and Jimmies and James. Uh, so this is from this is from Mr. Perpetual. If Mr. Perpetual is in the chat, David, Mr. Perpetual, he sent in a Tudor Black Bay bronze. And I love the numerals on this piece. Let's get this mouse working. Apologies for the delay. So this is one of his pieces. He sent me a few. I love the numeral placement on this watch. I just, what I don't like is the the Canadian Submariner style with the round plots and the, the snowflake hand. Omega, I mean, Tudor really needs to look at their dials and consider going all out snowflake. So there's so many comments going on in the chats right now. Uh, Asad saying, for an average guy, luxury watches are the most important, the most important or least important of things. Yeah, I agree. Um, GM Shadow Trader is asking, what am I going to get? I want to leave it as a surprise. Uh, I don't, another thing is I don't want to draw any attention to it because I want to make sure that I can get my hands on one. <laughs> That's another thing. I've noticed just how influential a simple watch channel can be. Uh, you say something great about a watch and suddenly there's, you don't even need to, you know, even 10 people can make a huge impact in the space buying up something. And uh, if 10 people go into an authorized dealer and ask for one watch, that's a hell of an impact. So I'm going to try my best to, to back down a bit. Oh, and Joseph saying uh, no perpetuals freaking out on a leap year day. Don't worry. There are some perpetuals. Some guys were ahead of the curve and said, um, since there is a leap year, this is the 29th of February, uh, they've sent in some really cool pieces. Don't worry. There's some amazing watches. We're just warming up here. We're going to get into some cool stuff. Again, I have to say, I don't know what's up next. I'm just scrolling through what's been sent in. Uh, let's see. Uh, there are no ex-Marines, only Marines, Chris says. Yeah, true. Really true. I appreciate all, all men in the military, men and women in the military. Hell of a job. Uh, let's see what's going on. Orange Hand, your watches are coming up soon. Explorer of Dial on a Black Bay 58 would be great. Sure would be. And Thomas, he does like, that, that is a nice looking piece. What they've done well with this watch, just on first impressions when we have a look at it. I've seen a few of these in authorized dealers before. Love the love the gray, the use of the gray on the dial and on the bezel. It contrasts so nicely against the bronze. Because when we think yellow gold, we think black. You know, there's a clash between parts. So the thinking of, of going bronze, which is a, you know, a softer, softer hue, 
and blending it with this almost blue black finish looks gorgeous really is nice and i do love the 369 i'm a sucker for any dial that has 369 on it or any kind of numeral layout with the plots okay neo thank you so much for the super chat um, i'm pretty sure we have have we looked at your watches yet i think we have no we haven't we will be getting there your watches are in here as well uh i'm getting the mcqueen hell i'd love that i would love that but no it won't be a mcqueen but it's just as cool it is just as cool uh, Ryan saying, do we get the chance to influence your purchase on the luxury watch? Very good point. That's a very good point. Actually, you won't believe this, but next week's sh uh, stream is going to be about, uh, the theme is going to be something like, if you could buy your first watch again. Don't, don't mention that in the comments now, but that's going to be the subject. And we're going to get deep into that, get very philosophical. So, uh, yeah, we're going to enjoy it. Uh, let's see. I've tried to find some nice videos of the date change between the 29th and the 1st of March. No nice content. Yeah, interesting because, I mean, these watches should know. If, when, when you have a, the differences, let's get to the watches first, and I'll explain that. I need to try and keep my mind open. And uh, is Ori in the chat? Ori is in the chat. Got some awesome watches that we'll be seeing just now. Uh, okay, let's get through here. There's lots of names, lots of, lots of mentions. Uh, so thank you for this, David, for this, Mr. Perpetual, for this beautiful piece. And next, he submitted a Yacht Master. Now, this is cool. We very seldomly see, this is a 40 millimeter Yacht Master, rose gold, two-tone, with this beautiful brown dial. And I would love to see, I would love to see Rolex, with their root beer, go brown, uh, explosive dial. There, you know, it looks so good. This contrast... It's almost like the sleeper root beer at this point in time, you know? I uh, love it. Uh, I've actually been looking at the Yacht Master, <clears throat> you know, ogling and boggling and having a good browse. <laughs> and Ari said, I've already tried to convince, we've talked about it already, the 21470, yeah, I've been, I've been checking it out. I'm, I'm very much on the fence. It's actually between that watch and another. And uh, yeah, anyway. Collecting watches is a lifelong hobby. Some of most interesting watches are not the most expensive. Definitely the most interesting people are not the most successful, Mark P says. That's very well said, Mark. And it is. It is a lifelong journey. This hobby of ours, what I love so much about it is that you don't get too old to enjoy it. You know, when we think of other hobbies out there, like you know, more athletic hobbies, for example, motorsports, you know, at certain points in time, you're going to have to back off from it because you can't do certain things that you could 50 years before. With this, all that's happening as we're doing this, as we're engaging, we're learning more, our brains, our minds, our thoughts on the subjects just keep expanding. So it's great. It's like, it's like a dictionary, this whole exercise, the process. Love it. Uh, no photographic evidence of McQueen wearing the 1655? No. And uh, I, yeah, I'm one of those people who gets a little bit upset when there's mentioned that it's a McQueen watch because it really isn't. It was something created by auctioneers and by Italian collectors at a time, even though the Italians call it Freccione, so uh, for meaning big arrow or arrow. But uh, it's if you watch the Craft and Tailored video on the 1655, I highly recommend it. Get onto Craft and Tailored. Go onto Google, type in Craft and Tailored, look at his YouTube page. He's got some amazing stuff. And he has a good flip out session talking about the, the Steve McQueen why did I just call it the Steve McQueen? 1655. Okay. Please tell me it's an IWC. <laughs> Dylan Lamb says, no, it's not an IWC. Don't worry. We'll get there eventually. Again, we've got the whole year for me to, uh, <laughs> to get to that point. But uh, it's getting back to the art master. We're getting too engaged in the comments. I love the combination of these colors. I'll say again, very sleeper in the family. And you seldomly see this watch. So great. Mr. Perpetual, if you are in the chat, there you are. Awesome. Uh, thank you so much for sending these in. It was great seeing these pieces. I love this piece. Stellar. Next, David G. Oh, and here's David. This is David's submission to me uh, that has become the cover page. I won't uh, give out your, sec your surname, David, but this is the watch that he sent in. And what I loved about it, not just the composition, the lighting, the, but the setting. Look at that background. On a ski slope, I would imagine, I don't know, Austria. I really don't know. It'd be interesting to know where exactly this was taken. I would imagine somewhere like Austria or Switzerland or could be in the States, could be Colorado. I have absolutely no idea. But the, oh, oh, it's just so good. 
Who takes a Mark II Speedmaster skiing or snowboarding? I love it. I just love it. I think it, it makes it su it's such a nice context to have a watch like this because it doesn't have screw down pushes, it doesn't have a screw down crown. This is a sports watch, but it's not, if you fall into the snow with it, the, the purist would get terrified with the idea that you would get waterlogged and everything, but it's a sports watch. Take it, use it, bash the hell out of it, enjoy it. Oh, that contrast. I, I, again, I, I made a video about the Mark II a week or so ago, and I really enjoyed it because we got to look at that 70s aesthetic and just how influential the Alaska project was to the development of this piece. Those orange highlights, that racing dial. You'll be seeing another Speedmaster very soon from my man Fahim. I will link his, uh, his username, his Instagram handle in the chat when we get to him. But it's another Speedmaster, very rare. And this man takes the best photos. So we will get there. Dr. J, a calm and modest life brings more happiness than the pursuit of success combined with constant restlessness. Very well said. That is the Einstein quote. I love that quote. It was written on a little piece of paper, if I'm remembering this history right. He wrote this little quote on a piece of paper that was lost. It was a letter that he wrote, something like that. And it was auctioned. But it's just such a brilliant quote. And I think it's something we can all learn from. The pursuit and the constant unrest. Sometimes you just need to sit back and say, hey, we're doing pretty well with what I have or where I'm going. And, you know. Uh, so this is just beautiful. It's, it's my favorite photo, I think, of the show. And again, I'll emphasize, if you come come the next stream, if we carry on with this wrist shot week, the best photo that is sent to me, I will send you a private email asking if it can be used as the cover. And so it goes. It just brings us together. I just love this watch. The, the matte dial, the flat colors. Let's get a good close look at it as I get to the chat. Um, and, and Thomas Burnett says, loves the shape. There's something about that shape. And Thomas Burnett will be seeing your watch very soon. A baby Ploprof, beautiful watch, same case shape. This would suit you down to the ground, Thomas. I love the orange highlights. That's what really makes this watch sing to me. I think this is the true Mark II Speedmaster, you know? Awesome. Okay, let's have a look. What else is going on? Everyone's saying gorgeous watch. That's cool. <laughs> Has anyone submitted a Ulysses Nardan erotica? No, they haven't. Uh, I would, you know, I don't know if I would be allowed to share it. The thing is, though, you wouldn't be able to see it in action. Erotica watches are awesome. I freaking love them. My favorite erotica watches are the ones that the, the actual movement is hidden at the back. So only you, the wearer, knows about the piece. Um, when it's on the dial, it's a bit gaudy, but that's kind of the point. So, <laughs> yeah, it's just cool. I dig erotica watches. I think I'm sure I'll share it. I would share it. It's not like YouTube would ban me because of that. Uh, Clam Walker, thank you so, so much for the super chat. It is absolute, it's such a pleasure. And um, we're going to keep getting into this. There's so much more variety. We haven't even gotten to, you know, we've, we're, we're sitting at D at the moment. We're getting all the way to W, I think, is the last name on the list. Okay. So it's a beautiful watch. I just think it's great. Another thing to highlight that wasn't mentioned in the show is that this bezel glows in the dark. This watch looms up so well in the dark. So you could... Essentially, I don't think you can use the chronograph so much, but the idea that the tachymeter glows and it's, it's such a great callback. Of course, this model uses a coaxial movement, so it's not period correct. It has a date complication at the base. but so much more practical for everyday use. The bracelet is rock solid, uh, beautiful clasp. What can we say? Next, dear artifact, if you're still in the chat, you're up next, brother. And this man takes some stellar, stellar photo photograph. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave this up for a moment while I drop in his Instagram handle. And I hope I get this right. Dear Artifact. Ah, let's see. Type it in. I think. No. Did I botch it? There we go. If you're on Instagram, follow Dear Artifact immediately. I want to see him get to 1,000 followers because he deserves it. His photos are stellar. And this piece is a Smith's Everest 36, PRS 25. And this watch has become quite a cult classic. <laughs> it seems like the community is enjoying this piece a lot. And uh, I just love it. I've, I've spoken about this watch at length. I am going to make a video about this watch. I'm, st I'm actually working on a write-up right now. The history behind the Smith's name well worth sharing. But let's get right up close. Again, Dear Artifact does not miss a beat. The details, the colors, he's got a few photos of this piece. This is the watch on its original bracelet. 
it's a solid 20 mil that goes all the way through doesn't taper um, i've swapped mine out for a vintage rivet style piece and uh oh, this is great let's get to the next one whoa sorry magic mouse work with me here sweetheart there we go it's a better one it's just stellar and if i do a little bit of a rotate we get to see it oh that dial that's the thing another thing i'll say I wore this watch all week. I told myself, let's wear one watch this week. I put on the Smiths with my vintage rivet bracelet, wore it all week. And I thought, you know, I'm one of those people who, who can't sit still with a watch. You know, give me a day or two and I'll swap out to something else. But I wore this all week without even contemplating changing it. And there are very few watches out there that makes someone do that, especially <laughs> Mr. Chapman, you hit the nail on the head, absolutely. Uh, there's something about the design of that 369 format that just sings to me every way. Another detail that maybe many of you haven't noticed is that it's called the Smith's Everest. The idea behind this watch, I'll explain the history briefly to you. Um, very simply, Smith's and Rolex worn by Edmund Hillary at the summit of Everest. There's debate both way around. Uh, but the Rolex wasn't an explorer. It wasn't a watch back then. It was just an Oyster Perpetual that Rolex provided. And the Smith's watch, in the 50s, it was Smith's real heyday, where just after the war, and finally, Smith's was able to grab Swiss watchmakers to come and work for them in the UK, in Britain, I should say, Great Britain. Um, and so the idea with Smith's and Rolex together, summiting Everest, it was a very triumphant moment. The idea behind this watch, of course, the Explorer, the Rolex Explorer became a watch to commemorate the event. But the Smith's Everest, what it manages to do here, it ties in the name of Smith's. These are all still made in the UK, which I love. It's, it's very much a micro brand at this point, but the pieces on offer are awesome. Highly recommend you look up, go onto timefactors.com and you'll see Smith's watches from all over the show. What this watch does, which I love, and this will be the, the main part of the write-up of the video, is that it uses 1016 motifs uh, with the idea of that vintage styling commemorating the Everest climb. And uh, it's a really nice callback. I would say this has to be one of the best historic homage watches out there nowadays uh, because no one, no one in their right mind knows what a 1016 is unless you know watches and the hobby and all the rest. So for that reason, it gets a nod for me and I, I'll never sell mine. I can sell, tell you that much. I could probably sell the rest of my collection, no, no worries. But this one to me, it's going to be a keeper. Smiths were also big on car instruments, Julian says. Absolutely. They did clocks. Uh, they, they, so they have an amazing history. They, they started with automotive manufacturing, actually, making car parts before getting into watches. Then they were like a boutique. De they were a dealer for watches. They never made anything. Slowly but surely, after the war ended and uh, you know, soldiers were coming back, they could actually outsource Swiss watchmaking to come to the UK, to England. And they, for the first time, could call themselves uh, Swiss made, I think. They were even Swiss made watches back then. Look it up on eBay. Smiths, they've got amazing selections of pieces. You can still find vintage Smiths watches that were taken up Everest, the same model reference and line. Yeah, I've spoken a lot. I'm going to refer back. So, dear Artifact, get, on in, get onto Instagram and follow this guy. Love his stuff. Beautiful photos, high res, gorgeous. Next. This is from Driven to Win. I hope I'm saying that right. But his caption for this was basically uh, garden, garden work, barbecue, and cigars. And this is a Hamilton Khaki Navy. This is probably a better shot to get to begin with. Hamilton Khaki Navy. We seldom see this piece. And look at that dial. That looks eerily similar to a Vacheron Constantin overseas. We look at that layout. Too cool. And the symmetry is really nice. Okay, I'm gonna catch up with all of you in the chat, get back into it. Uh, there's lots of talk about Smiths make the logo smaller. Yeah, I mean, there's, when it comes to brands, speaking of which, I would love to get involved with the Smiths name. And there is an interesting development going on behind the scenes, actually. I received an email a couple of months ago about a development that I think we're all going to enjoy very much. I hope to debut it. I feel like I promoted this watch a lot, the little, the little Smiths Everest. Gorgeous piece. Okay, catching up with all of you in the comments. I hope I can get there. 63 Mini had a Smith. That's awesome. Yeah, my uh, my mum used a, had a Mini back in the day, an orange Mini with a, with a white roof. 
they were stellar cars and i'm driving a 68 vw beetle <laughs> okay chip wong welcome jimmy lots of names so this piece is great it's nice getting out into into new realms of pieces watch habit thank you so much thank you so much um and it's it's just so great seeing the level of variety we went from smith's now to hamilton i love the the minute track on this piece as well the rail style effect 24 hour time very typical of a hamilton watch and just getting to another angle where we get some less light beautiful accent i really i really like the dial the idea of the quarters being held up by these these triangles that have been cut off interesting piece uh, and the red accent on the, the arrow hand unique offset date window we seldom see it's so easy to actually put a date window offset you just cut a different hole in the dial you know instead of having it at the at the three you just cut a square at the base great though thank you for the suggestion well thank you for the watch driven to win is there another piece there's a few these i don't know I've got, I've got a repeat here next we're getting to a crazy piece are you ready this is from fahim now he goes by the username of king flume get onto instagram right now and follow king flume i hope i pronounced i hope i spelled that right but uh there it is i hope you can see it i hope it's been shared okay he he gained so many followers from me uh the last stream and let's make that continue because his photos are stellar this is the tintin the omega speedmaster tintin and has to be one of the coolest watches out there just because it's so the, the uniqueness is so minor but it's very impactful you seldom see a a speedmaster with a, a rail racing track you know on the dial and his photos are just gorgeous we see the highlights of red and black and as we get through he sent me lots so we will be seeing a few wrist shots he loves this piece it's one of his his daily wear wearers um i don't uh, is this actually a schumacher variant because i don't know i know that it has received the nickname of tintin but i don't know if this is affiliated to schumacher or not uh, let's get through what else is going on here. Watch habit. Would love your thoughts on the Rolex GMT meteorite. Picked one up two days ago. I can't stop staring at it. You know, the dial is beautiful. I have said, okay, I will, uh, we'll just get to it now. I just want to catch up with everything else. Welcome. Nasty vinyl. Great to have you here, sir. Um, to the Tintin is great. Mr. Perpetual, thank you so much for the super chat. It's such a pleasure. Please send me more of your watches to do these discussions. I'm enjoying it so much. Uh, this this idea of sharing your watches with everyone it's an absolute pleasure like i said in the beginning of the show uh we attempted this stream first last week last weekend and the response was so good i thought hey let's try again let's try and cement this idea of wrist shot week and i received basically double the amount of emails over that period of time which is just nuts we've already been going for over an hour and we've only gotten to f so i need to hurry up <laughs> uh, but we can try i think yeah, I'm just going to slowly but surely go through these. I won't repeat the watches again like I did in the first stream, but, you know. Um, Raymond asking, is Basel World postponed or cancelled? It's postponed January till January. And if we want to talk about the coronavirus, whew, Friday. Friday was quite a all of a sudden media meltdown that uh, the world was coming to an end. You know, there was an interesting story about just how influential the telephone has been to the stock market over the years and just how, of an, how much of an impact it made to trade once it was invented the whole idea of media and marketing affects everything that we do nowadays and uh, you shouldn't take it all to heart i'll say that much but i mean fahim again king flume he takes some amazing photos he loves i, I love this check this out red accent of a strap i think this is some velcro strap i think he's wearing red nikes or whatever else and just gorgeous black and white with the piece on mm, it's just stellar i love it he takes some really interesting photographs so if you do have instagram i highly suggest you follow him and uh, one flume over the cuckoo's nest <laughs> that's good <laughs> okay um so the, there was a question about the meteorite gmt i do love the design i love the, the white the white on white effect it calls back to those Pan Am GMT references of the past. Who was the one who asked me the question? Uh, let's see if I can find it. And thank you for tagging me in the chat. I get to see it. Watch Habit. There it is. And thank you for the super chat. <laughs> um, so I love the idea that the white on white is something really special. The fact that it is unique to have the meteorite is also something special. What I don't like is that Rolex can, can hype up a 
a finish like Meteorite on a dial, where so many other brands do it as well for a tenth of the price. That's the one thing that, that irritates me about it. But with regards to the finish, the whole, the whole idea of Meteorite on a dial, it's like a fingerprint, which is great. There are no two watches that look the same. And it's all up to the owner. Uh, you know, they're, they're the only ones who can really share what they have with a Meteorite dial watch. And it's beautiful. It is a beautiful piece. Um, I'm, it's a, it is a white gold variant. It's the most recent white gold variant of the GMT, if I'm not wrong. You can correct me on that. Uh, but I also love, I think what I love more than the Meteorite, sorry to say, watch habit, is the blue dial GMT Pepsi, white gold. That just sings to me. Uh, when we get to, come come next week's stream, we will get to more uh, private searching for different watches. This is a time where we're just looking at separate collections, but come next week, we're going to go to a more topical discussion again, get into that variety, and we'll we'll engage a bit more. Okay, Rolex might not release anything. Yeah, I know, I know. It's all just speculation. I just loved it because I could get a chance to uh, modify, upgrade, design, edit things, share some of my thoughts. What do I think of the A381 Revival, Tippy says. I'll, I'll stick on that. Let me try and like get to another picture for all of us to have a look at. Uh, that is the, the Revolution Watch variant with the blue dial. I still, compared to the A384, doesn't come close, I'm sorry to say. Uh, I find... The, the blue dial very polarizing and the panda dial is just timeless panda dial on a watch works for me so much more i could i could wear a panda dial every day but a blue dial watch not so much um but that's just me i need to have a better look at it honestly i haven't been doing much watch surfing lately uh this has been a time when i've focused on a watch and gone to the next and saturday for me is kickback time look at this guy i mean he just, I love the shirt he's wearing and the, the reds and the blues and the, follow him on Instagram. You won't be disappointed. He has a gorgeous, gorgeous collection. This is on a NATO strap. Oh, I just love it. And it's nice seeing such like close up images on these pieces. He loves red. He clearly loves wearing red. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so, so talking about, um, yeah, talking about this whole virus scenario, Okay, we must actually take it seriously. <laughs> like, I uh, I am from a medical background, and uh, virology is something that I'm well acquainted with. If you don't know, I can give you a bit of a, a bit of a background story. My old man has cystic fibrosis. If anyone knows what cystic fibrosis is, you are susceptible to all sorts. <laughs> and uh, he had a bilateral lung transplant. We can get into that at the later stage. But uh, viruses should not be taken lightly because they can kick you when you're down. I can tell you that much. If your immune system is compromised, you must be careful. Uh, with regards to what we know, it loves surfaces. It loves remaining on surfaces far longer than most viruses. Uh, why it goes to the lungs and why it causes pneumonia so rapidly, it's, it's, it seems quite aggressive, especially to those who are quite old. You know, the, the elderly seem more affected by it. Um, but, you know, I, I am quite a stickler when it comes to this sort of stuff. So I have stocked up on a mask to keep myself safe. Uh, I do know the implications of how bad a virus can be if it affects you. And this one, it has teeth. You can say that much. Really, really has teeth. Uh, speaking of which, I mean, talking about how pedantic we are, uh, my family bought N95 masks uh, two months ago. <laughs> the second the virus was, was told and spoken about, the second it moved out of China, we uh, we went full full force. Uh, highly suggest latex gloves, neoprene gloves for you to wear as well. Protect your hands, wash your hands, cover your face. The reason why you should not wear medical masks is that medical masks are designed for you to keep your bugs to yourself. So you can't breathe on your patients when you're in surgery operating. Uh, the N95 masks designed to keep dust particles and the rest out of your lungs for workshop space. Uh, much more effective. Another thing is when a medical mask gets wet, when there's moisture on the mask, it becomes useless. Your mucous membranes absorb it very quickly. So um, really, all I can say, last thing I'll say about this virus is really don't underestimate it. Yes, there has been a lot of hype. There's been a lot of uh, fear and everything else. There have been a considerable amount of deaths, which is quite alarming. But I wouldn't say you should take it lightly. You should treat this. You should be aware. Say that much. Um, be aware of what you're dealing with, who you are around, and look after yourselves because no one wants to get sick. And 
we've got to keep this virus down. I mean, geez, a third of the population getting it one day, 30% possibly. Not good, you know? Anyway, get away from the subject. Fahim, love these pieces, love these photos of yours. And uh, it's nice It's nice to see that the chat like stopped for a second so you could hear me. <laughs> it's cool. Uh, you heard my little tirade 75 minutes in with the coronavirus. Yeah, keep yourself safe. Check this out. Love this gray contrast. Gray on red, beautiful finish. Mm, 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 mm. So again, if you're on Instagram, follow this man. Protect your watches, CB says. Absolutely. Uh, and Mr. Perpetual, it's all over the show. Um, you know, uh, if, if it breaks out anywhere. I'm from South Africa. Apparently, it's in South Africa. There hasn't even been mention about it. And if you know that part of the world and the, the different life that people live in townships and all the rest, it will... <laughs> It's a sneaky bugger, you know? Uh, it'll hit a lot of people. And if you have a compromised immune system, the irony is if you have HIV and you're on antiretrovirals, you could be safe. <laughs> anyway, stop talking about the medical stuff, dude. I wanted to get into medicine at one stage in my life. So I know I know quite a lot about it, but next. So from Fahim, we're getting to Guantam with the Tudor Black Bay GMT. Now he sent, last week, he sent a gorgeous Breguet retrograde. If you... Um, if you haven't seen the first stream, again, I will link it in the corner at the beginning of the show uh, once this is being revised. But it was a beautiful open work Breguet. It's like the, the epitome of what you want to see from a Breguet watch. And uh, the rubber strap on this piece, again, he's, he's sent in some gorgeous two pieces, two Tudors, Black Bay on rubber. Looks like it's got red accents underneath. Love the integrated look, love the balance. Looks absolutely stellar. Can't go wrong with this watch. Tudor for me is not a brand that I would like uh, for the first watch, which I'll get to now. I can talk about it. Um, <laughs> COVID couldn't touch my G-Shock. It's funny. <laughs> um, should I get HIV then? No, Kukuru. Really, don't, don't go that far. But uh, initially, just thinking about how effective, apparently, antiretrovirals have been used to, to treat this condition. Uh, not heavy-duty antiretrovirals, but they seem to do the trick, or at least you know, slow it down a bit. N95 masks, the hospital uses near me and yeah, very place where it seems to be originated. Yeah, I mean, Forbin, it's it's all very peculiar. I don't know how this started. There's all sorts of speculations and rumors about this might have been a, a predicted thing, a planned thing. It's hit Zimbabwe as well, Lee says. Yeah, I'm afraid Africa, you have to really be worried in Africa, but uh, stay away from Corona beer. That was a headline actually, Raymond. Um, so really all I can say, uh, just if we, can we put a stopper on this like discussion, it's, it's difficult to, to hone in on just how, how much of a grip it's going to take. We think about just where it's spread and the numbers, uh, per, per country. Generally they say it has gone, uh, what's the word? I'm falling a blank right now. When it's actually reached its mass, its epidemic rate. Is that what the word would be? 20 plus people per capital. And I don't think it's hit there yet. But again, it is a virus. Take care of yourselves. Be cautious. That's all that needs to be said. And uh, let's talk about avoiding McDonald's and fast food. Yeah, I mean, the Daytona is the corona of watches, pilot style. That's fantastic. Okay, beautiful photo from Guantan. I love the, I'd imagine it's a rubber bee strap. I don't know if rubber bee incorporates the red on the underside, but stunning looking piece. And next, Tudor Sub. And what I'll say is, with regards to Tudor, the modern watches, pandemic, thank you, Neville. I've uh, drawn a blank. It's difficult presenting. Um, what I'll say about Tudor watches, why I would not go for a Tudor watch as my first like foray into luxury pieces, is that I find that Tudor is still too much of an homage to Rolex watches, in a way. And that's not a bad thing. I mean, geez, they are stellar. You cannot deny that these watches, they are perfectly well-made. Uh, movements are in-house, and they've really gone very far with what they've done. But for me, I just, I wouldn't go so far to get a Tudor as a first watch. I would rather, and there's there's often talk about a, a Tudor Black Bay or an Amiga Seamaster. I would go Seamaster any day of the week. That's just my uh, my opinion on the subject. Your opinion may vary, as always. As you know, this is all me sharing my thoughts. This Submariner, I don't know the year. It's a 7909. I don't think he gave me the date of the piece. No, he didn't. But I've said that if Tudor had to bring back the Submariner, it would be so nice 
to see this dial layout used on their pieces. Don't you think? This is the very, you know, the 80s transition, the 80s, 90s transition for Tudor. And uh, I, th I think it really looks good. It's very unique. And I think Tudor should adopt, be a bit more like outgoing with their dial designs. It's nothing wrong with the snowflake hand. I mean, it's cool. But on a, a generic round dial with, with rectangular plots and triangles, I think it could be a bit neater and sharper with a bit more of a, a change of pace. Tanzil, Tanzil Ansari is joining the show. Absolute pleasure having you here, Tan. Um, Panerai or Tudor, I would take Panerai over Tudor as well, uh, just because of the history that Panerai has. There's some gorgeous watches that they offer. I need to do more discussions around Panerai and their cases. Actually, I think there's a, there's a video on Zodiac that I've done, and I briefly touch on Panerai and their development over the years. Um, okay, catching up with everything else. There's lots of chats going on. I'm not even trying to scroll. I'm just, I've actually managed to keep up with the chat. So as it goes, I'm following, which is cool. This is from Jacob. Now, this is a 1976 CWC W10. W10. Uh, this whole family of watches developed because of the MOD, British Armed Forces, and I loved making that video end of last year sometime. The artifact saying uh, people bought the P01, uh, people thought they were getting when they teased the P01. That's it, yeah, the Tudor sub. I remember they did some very sneaky photos to get it going. The P01, in fact, I would say is a watch that I would go for in the Tudor family, actually because it's a prototype, because it's a concept watch that's very much, it was very much their own thinking over that time period. I would go for the P01 if I was looking at a Tudor. Interesting, I've just thought about that now. I think it's unique enough, where I think the, the GMTs and the other references are a little bit too safe. I like, I like it when a brand goes further and tries something a bit more hardcore, uh, polarizes their audience, you know? That CD, CWC looks like a Hamilton W10, Noldifa says, and that's why. Uh, it's for the reason because the Hamilton W10 was phased out and this was phased in. These pieces used Hamilton movements just as the contract ended, so CWC stepped in, made to the same spec as Jacob says, exactly. Uh, I loved that that military video was a lot of fun. Went through a hundred years of watch history from the First World War all the way to the modern time and we looked at the entire development of military watches. And I'm currently working on one for the French Armed Forces, which is looking so good. Uh, there's an amazing history, especially with their chronographs that I want to get into. I'm actually going to spend next week working on it. But uh, these pieces, the, the 70s, you can really see the 70s taking hold with these cases, kind of cushion-esque, very peculiar. But this dial design takes that, I, I love it. If you look at that video, I go into depth talking about how the Flieger influenced the field watch and how the field watch then slowly but surely started being hybridized. You, any, any watch that has W10 affiliated to its name incorporates a dial pretty much just like this. You get the Smith's W10, Hamilton W10. There was a G10 of a variant at its stage. It's just cool. Awesome watch. I love the condition of it too. So thank you, Jacob, for sending that in. Love it on the brown strap as well. And the size is also great. It's hard to actually tell from a distance, but uh, I, th I think these watches probably measured around 36 mils. Presence, easy legibility, you can tell the time, uh, broad arrow hand. All of these models actually have military stocking numbers, so they're legitimate. It's not just for aesthetics and for show. Love it. So it's a real purpose built military piece, hand wound, Hamilton movement. Next, this is from James. There's many James, James and Jamie's, and uh, we've got lots of J's we're going through now. Uh, J as in James, not J as in joint. Uh, so this is a gorgeous uh, Amiga DeVille chronograph, chronometer, and the size is quite something to take in. It has these huge lugs, corn de vache style lugs, and when I get to the next slide, you will find, yeah, it looks like VC lugs, absolutely. When I get to the next slide, you'll see something quite interesting about this piece that you don't see with many watches. Because of its huge lugs, they had to innovate in a few places. Um, I'd like to talk more about the P01 in next week's stream, saying uh, future hit. I think it is. I think it's one of those watches. It's funny how it turned up so many noses when it was released. Reminds me of Parmigiani, Tippy says. It does, you know? This, this Omega looks very much like a Parmigiani, uh, like, a toric, like a toric chronograph or something. It's funny how the, the community's noses get turned up by uh, an out, out there release. The first thing I said, you know, I, I started really getting into the writing and the essays about this time last year, March, March last year. 
And I said from the get-go that I like the fact, I thought it was peculiar at first, but I, I said that I really like the fact that Tudor was able to go that extra bound and try something else, introduce something different. Of course, it's not to, not to everyone's tastes. And that's a good thing. What's the point of selling a watch that appeals to everyone? Uh, I th another thing about the show that I love is that we get to see such diversity and variety and all the rest. Okay, catching up with all of you here. There's, there's lots of chats going on. I'm going to just try and keep up with what's scrolling down. Uh, Dan Radke, welcome to the show. Great having you. Tom Austin, awesome having you here, guys. Thank you so much for joining. Crappy, good to have you. I don't think I've seen you yet. Crappy, welcome. So the DeVille, I love the balance. Very unique watch. We don't see this piece often at all. And there's a vintage DeVille that we will see later as well. Now, check this out. When we turn it to the side, notice that it has two separate holes for spring bars. Isn't that ingenious? So when it comes to wearing your leather straps, when you want the watch, if, if you have a bracelet, for example, the watch would fit perfectly at the lower hole. But uh, if you want to wear it on a leather strap, that's a bit more integral, where you don't see the, the opening when it's on your wrist. Having a second hole at the top is really cool. I've never heard of that before. Let me know if you have. Uh, great idea. Really great idea. And the design of the case is something. I mean, it's got, it's got crown guards and everything. I don't know what exactly they were trying to do with this piece. They've tried to make it very hardcore, formal for dress occasions, but also quite rugged in the way it's been formed. Interesting though. So thank you so much, James, for sending this in. Uh, Fahim caught the end. Yeah, you've just missed yourself, Fahim. Uh, we've been chatting about your, your, funnily enough, your, your area, we were looking at the coronavirus and talking about that over the red and blue, the red and white tint. And don't know how that happened, but you know how things go. This is from Jamie. And it's a Longines legend diver. I've been looking at this watch a lot. I've said this, and I've just finished a write-up, prepared and edited a write-up on Longines Heritage Classic. And I said that Longines is doing some great stuff with their reissue pieces. Longines and, and uh, what's the other name? Breitling. <laughs> Longines and Breitling are doing some great stuff with their development of uh, bringing out these reissue pieces. Yes, of course, it's not to everyone's tastes, but I like this variety. It's nice when they recreate a vintage piece like to the latter, really try and stick to all the elements that made it influential. And they, the, the, the price of these watches, I heard somewhere that Longines outsold uh, Patek Philippe last year with this. That's insane. Think about that for a second. Uh, I don't even know if, was it like a billion that they sold for in the end? Uh, crazy. and. What I know is that Longines mainly sponsors horse riding for the most part. When we see uh, what dressage, those kinds of events, you see Longines normally in the background. But I can't think of any other events that Longines sponsors. Maybe tennis. I don't know so much. But um, I love it. Compressor style case, compressor crowns, something about the inset, inset bezel. It's so nice. And those those minutes, minute tracks that run around. It's nice seeing such an accentuated line weight for the minute tracks. You very seldom see that. And what makes it so good is that at a glance, you can tell the time to the minute. That's what makes it so effective. Just a subtle glance to the dial will tell you that it is what? Three minutes, two minutes to 12. And there we go. Instead of like, you know, focusing on the five plots and trying to read a little bit more. It's a great looking piece. Thank you for the photo. It's nice seeing it on the wrist, how the lugs work. Uh, I'm sure this watch was scaled up ever so slightly uh, compared to the the original. Um, so for him asking, how do you tag reply to people? Uh, just type in at, so shift two on your keyboard, at, and then the name, or hashtag, hashtag also works, I think, and the name of the person who replied or who commented. James, welcome back. Uh, we've we've now arrived at J, uh, but you haven't sent anything in today. There's there's many Jameses and Jamies, and but uh, yeah, it's good because there's well over a hundred watches here to go through. So, you know, you're going to be here for a while. This next watch is from Jeffrey. And finally, we have a Vacheron Constantin, third generation chrono, blue dial. And uh, it's one of those watches that I really think is, a, is an undercover sleeper for what it is. And uh, yeah, this is great. I'm gonna see what else is going on here. There's lots, there's lots of comments in the chat. Uh, it's nice seeing that there's engagement in the chat between all of you while I just, I just talk over myself. <laughs> uh, Anyway, so uh, let's see what else is going on. Just talking about uh, London Watch Show. Um, okay, beautiful watch. There's a few 
Basher and Constantine pieces that we'll be looking at, and a few generations of the overseas as we get through. But this watch in particular, there is something about this piece. It's, it's often compared against the, the Nautilus and the Royal Oak, which you will also be seeing just now. I'm surprised we haven't hit any of like the heavy, heavy watches. By the time we get to Carassus, you'll be seeing some sick watches. Um, but I think there's something quite unique about this piece. I did a video about this watch a couple of months ago saying um, why, why Vacheron Constantin, why this overseas, you should pay attention to it. Talked through the history and the development of this watch all the way from the 222 up until now. And it's quite something to bring out a watch that is as impactful as this in a time when you have watches like the Royal Oak and the Nautilus, how all these brands are copying each other. I think this watch is wholly unique to Vacheron. Like this, this bracelet integration, I, I love it. It's one of the most interesting bracelet designs I've seen on a watch. The idea of, of putting the Maltese cross in every link. I mean, look at the polishing. It's so complex, eh? and it's not, it's not exactly a lot of work, but uh, if you know how CAD CAM works and, and all the bits and pieces when it comes to polishing and finishing, I'm sure a lot of this was cut in a, in a machine, but by hand, finishing all of these areas, this edge that actually juts out and how it then bends back in to each link. It's a complicated finish and it's really unique and interesting. I also like that the bezel continues the form of the Maltese cross running through it. It might be a bit kitschy and cliche uh, that some people might find, but I think it's just great. It's a nice transition of elements. There, there's a good sharing of parts everywhere down to just the rotor on this piece. The movement of this watch has the, the Maltese cross on it. I love it. A really unique piece. Love the dial, the balance, symmetry, blue. It's great. The fact that this watch comes with a leather strap and a rubber strap as well, very interchangeable. You can use it on a daily basis. This could be your one watch and uh, it's high horology. I mean, who are we kidding? It's stunning. And there was a mention about Corey Richards VC. Yeah, I got onto that, that Corey Richards train a long time ago before it became popular, before like there was, I've been following Corey Richards for a while as a photographer and uh, I love his, his excursions. He's done a lot of Everest trips but uh, this, this partnership with Vacheron, I've seen it, I saw it a long time ago, and then suddenly it went up for auction, and then everyone heard about it, thanks to Hodinkee and all the sites. His, his overseas GMT is very unique. We can have a look at it uh, come next stream when we get onto the, the more varied topics. But it's, if you just go onto Google, as Julie Hill says, uh, Corey Richards VC prototype. So it's the, it's the GMT that he wore up Everest, and it was a commemorative piece, one of one made, why that man would sell that watch or put it up for auction, I do not know. He should have kept that thing because it's beautiful. Calls back to the 1655 elements, very 70s with red ha with the orange hand, and yeah, it's great. Next, from Jeffrey. This is a Carl F. Bucherer Evo Tech Big Date. Now, I don't know a thing about this watch. <laughs> I throw up my hands and say, you guys need to explain it to me because I really don't. Uh, it has, I like the 70s elements to it, 70s inspiration. Very interesting. He sent me another watch as well, so we can have a look at that in a second as I get to your chats and see what else is going on. Vacheron finally gets the sports watch right, Hoplite says. I think they've done a, a great, great job. They've really developed that, that Gen 3. It is the Gen 3 overseas, right? They've done a superb job with bringing it out. Considering the variety that you get, three interchangeable brand, bands, as James says, absolutely. Okay, a very 70s cushion TV watch. Uh, Damien, everyone's asking me how to send a photo to me. So in the description of this video, you will see a, a link to my email. You don't, you don't, oh no, I didn't actually put it in. Oops. Uh, okay. If you go into the about section of my channel, you'll see my email at the bottom. Uh, I often, in the community posts, I often share my email as well. This will happen maybe once or twice every month. So in two weeks time, we can do another one of these shows and uh, yeah, we get to it. My, and just please, by all means, don't expect me to reply to 100 emails that come in. <laughs> it's very difficult just saving and naming these things as it is. Anyway, getting back to this, I've just noticed this looks like a power reserve. How cool is that? When do we ever see a power reserve? It says low, charge, high. Very interesting. I like it. Me and Carl F. Bucherer don't know much about it. So you'll have to, you know. It's one of those brands that's above my pay grade. <laughs> I look forward to uh, getting into it and studying a bit more. Again, this, these watches are for movement junkies uh, more than anything else. And I do need to uh, 
brush up on movements as time goes by. But I, there's something about the way that asymmetry is done correctly that I like, is when the entire dial incorporates asymmetry. So we have an offset date, but then we also have a power reserve and a date window. When a, when a dial only has one element that's offset, it's a bit confusing. That's, that's partly why the longer one is so unique, is because you get to see the offsetting work in tandem with everything else, the golden ratio and all of that. Again, done a video on the longer one, why it is considered perfect. There's lots, uh, there's lots of videos. It blows me away. I, uh, <laughs> I checked up on an old video a couple of months ago, uh, from a couple of months ago, and it's crazy just how uh, the, the presentation style has changed and it's less of a lecture, more of a conversation. And so this is also from Jeffrey. This is the same Jeffrey, I think. No, this is, a, this is another Jeff. This is, okay. The first Jeffrey <laughs> sent me Vacheron Chrono. The second Jeffrey sent me the Evo date. And this is a very important watch that he bought. It's a 41 mil date just. Uh, this was to mark an anniversary for him. Blue dial. And date justs on Jubilees just do it for me. I think it's gorgeous. If you want a date just, get it on a Jubilee. It looks stellar. Okay. Let's have a look at what else is going on. There's lots of chat about uh, par par panorama day date. Okay. Um, talking about sending me wrist shots and hand sanitizer and the whole thing. We're going at it, people. And uh, there's a lot of, there's going to be Seikos coming up very, uh, very soon, Thomas, talking about spring drives. You don't like the idea that the, the spring drive indicator is offset. Okay. We'll get to a few of them now as the stream develops. I can't believe we've been doing this for 95 minutes. Good grief. Okay. I need to pick up the pace, people. This is insane. Uh, I've been sitting on this for so long, and we've only reached J, so I'm going to slowly but surely get through. Gorgeous watch. It's nice seeing it on the wrist, fitting perfectly on a wrist. And then we've got a, is this an Emperor Butterfly? I don't know. You can correct me there. Then check this out. This is from Jim, and this is the brand new Seiko Alpinus that's just been released under the Prospex line name. I did a Prospex video, geez, also like two weeks ago. And I said, this is one of the coolest moves that Seiko has done to the Alpinist. I really feel like this is more attuned to what we would expect from a monarch butterfly. Thank you, Freddie. <laughs> uh, this is what we would expect to see from an Alpinist. At least when I close my eyes and imagine what the watch would look like. Check that out. I think it's great. Shark teeth styled indices. Nice and symmetrical. Easy to read. Uh, something about the original that I didn't like is the, is the use of the different typefaces that make them look a little bit more old school. This looks very modern. And then you have this, this blend with the, with the cathedral styled hand and uh, the red and black contrast. Looks great, really understated. Looks like an adventurer's instrument. I think it's great. So thank you, Jim, for sending this in. Uh, we haven't seen many of these on the wrist yet, so it's cool. Don't know so much about the, the Cyclops lens on the, the crystal. So uh, unique watch, interesting. Really nice seeing it in the wild. Next, from John, check it out. CMOS Professional 300 Great White. Now, I might be wrong in saying this, but when this watch was released, I tried to get on top of it as soon as possible and report its release, and I called it the Great White uh, Rolex Killer, I think, because I loved the idea that this watch was going against the, the grain, uh, looking at the Polar Explorer and the, the Panda Daytona. And as I mentioned about NYC, speaking of New York City, there's, there's huge snowstorms going on there right now. I really hope everyone's okay. <laughs> uh, for anyone who's in New York, I hope you're okay at this point in time. I do remember seeing that there's this crazy storm going on there. And uh, yeah, getting back on topic, Paul, thank you so much for the super chat, Paul. Absolutely, such a pleasure. Uh, I like I like that you comment super chat. It's a super chat comment of a super chat, kind of like a. <laughs> A little bit of an inception there. Lunger Datograph Tourbillon. We will have to look at, you know, Raymond, when we get to the next stream, when we start talking about the more varied watches, we will uh, we'll look at, you know, whatever's suggested. I want to try and keep this focused on the wristwatches themselves here. So I, th I have a feeling, I might be wrong on this, but I think I might have credited the name Great White to this piece. And a few Watchbox in particular mentioned Great White in one of the shows. And I thought, hey, is that a thing? I do know there has been a Seamaster white before. Uh, they've had a few white Seamasters in the past, but I love this contrast. The black and white is just so cool. One element that I wish they improved on this watch, thinking about it a bit more. I've seen 
I've seen these pieces in the flesh. It would be so nice to see these numerals slightly darker, having a bit of a darker, let me try and get this mouse to work, a bit of a darker outline around the numerals. I think at a glance, it might be a bit difficult to see them. Um, you know, and referring back to the Polar Explorer, I think that what that's what it's done so well, the, the 216750 Polar Explorer. They've really hit the, the darkness on point. Where this watch, I think it loses a little bit with the lightness of the plots, but I just love the contrast. White and black is such an interesting, such an interesting blend of colors with the red highlights and accents. Beautiful photo. We seldomly see this watch on the wrist uh, because it is relatively new. It only came out at the end of, of last year. Stunning. Okay, gorgeous photo. Thank you so much, John, for sending it in. This is from another John, and he sends a Seiko Marine Master. Okay, this was from last week's show. And uh, we will see some really cool watches in a second. Okay, uh, so this is from John. I need to try and keep up with the chats while I'm doing this because I am, I'm neglecting all of you. I apologize. <laughs> uh, so, so Damien says, how old am I? Subscribe to me. Thank you, Damien. Um, how old am I? 20, 20, so I'm 26. I'm 26 years old. It's crazy to think. <laughs> I, uh, I don't even keep track of my age. Honestly, it's like the least of my concerns. But I'm 26. I'm still a youngster. Just graduated from university and uh, getting, getting stuck into it, you know. So talking about these two pieces, we've got a Grand Seiko Chrono. Very interesting watch with these pushes. I don't know anything about these watches. So please, you, you'll know better than me. I can see it's a spring drive. It has the, the sub-second or the offset power reserve. And then we jump to a Marine Master, another diver, just great. Interesting pairing. And compared to what we will see next, uh, you're going to see something very, very cool. <laughs> to be saying, concentrate on wrist shots, chop, top, top. Okay, I'm gonna get there, let's get there. Next from John, be ready, be ready for this. Uh, same, same guy, Patek Annual Calendar Stainless Steel. Now we, this, this watch is really sought after because as we know, Patek doesn't focus on stainless steel watches very often. And when they do, they become very collectible. So this was him at a dinner somewhere. And uh, the next photo that we will see, again, this was these were very late submissions last week that I missed and I couldn't get to them. So luckily now in the show, we can actually have a look at them closely. Next though, this is him on a slope again. Now talking about the, uh, the Speedmaster Mark II that we saw earlier on the slope, how cool is it seeing this watch? <laughs> on the slopes. Isn't that awesome? It's just great. I love it. And uh, I really do like the, the combination. I, I've said a few times that I'm not so much of a fan of Patek with their use of windows. I think any dress watch should really focus more on getting dials to do the work for them or having long hands to stretch around the dial instead. But with this watch, it is so stealth. You really wouldn't know well, I mean, the bracelet and everything else kind of gives it away. It's very, it's very bright, but uh, it's a unique piece in the family. I mean, they're, they're hellish expensive. I don't even want to know. Rich Buddy, thank you so much for joining. And I was just about to say, I don't know what they cost. 65K MSRP. That is just out of this world. I just, you know, for someone like me, I'll be buying a house. <laughs> uh, it's insane. So that's retail. That's the retail price. Rich Buddy, thank you so much for joining. I love watching your shows. I, I generally miss your, your shows because it's very early in the morning, California time, but I love catching up and listening to what you present. Your shows are awesome. It's so great hearing, hearing discussions from experience, you know? Love it. John, this is from John. This was another submission from last week. Standard Explorer, five-digit reference on a NATO. I, I would imagine this is a, a, like a paracord elastic NATO. Love that gray contrast. This is a beautiful photo. This was actually, I was considering using this as the cover for the show, but um, the, the Omega Mark II did it for me instead. Oh, this is beautiful though. I love the gray on gray. John really sent some gorgeous watches and I, I'm sure he did send me a repeat of the watches. I went back in time and uh, caught up with the watches that were sent at the end of last, last week's show. Beautiful piece though. I love the contrast, love the balance. The gray NATO or the great strap just makes it even cleaner. Beautiful. And the next submission, I think this is the only Blanc Pond that we will be seeing, but it's the 50 Fathoms. And it's a watch that seems to divide the community a lot, but I, I don't know why. Uh, the, the 50 Fathoms is such an influential piece. 
it really sits in line with watches like, I mean, I love the story. This watch and Zodiac and Panerai were the three brands that really had dive watches on point, you know? And uh, it's, it's amazing that uh, this watch seems to get a lot of flack. I guess it's because Blancpain is not privately owned anymore. I don't know the, the logistics, but the brand, the movement is superb. It's rugged. It's got sapphire on its on its bezel. It's unique. It still sticks to that that vintage time uh, with regards to their inspirations and everything. Did a video on Blancpain again. I recommend you have a look at it if you get a chance. Uh, really nice seeing this piece on the wrist. The only problem is you're, you're, it's difficult for a watch like this to be worn by most people because it's in range, it's 44 mils in diameter, 44 millimeters. And uh, that can cause a problem. But as a legible diving instrument, dive watch, great, really is cool. Uh, so, so nice seeing this. So John, thank you so much for sending this in. And there was a question about how do I, I vet out the watches that get sent to me? I don't, you send them to me, I give it, I give your name and the model number of the watch, put it in a file, Put it together. I'm not picky at all. Um, it's it's all just up to. I just I just want to see variety. That's all that matters, really. That's the point of the show. That's what I'm enjoying so much is that the level of variety from people. It's awesome. Next, we have a character of the diving watch of the 70s. Doxa sub in orange, like we expect to see. Um, last week, I looked at a Doxa sub that had a white a blue dial. I think blue with white accents. This is the more genuine Jacques Cousteau, what we would expect to see from the time. Beautiful condition. I don't know if this is a reissue or if this is an original. I'm not that well versed with the brand, but uh, you know, just getting there slowly. And I'm going to catch up with you because there's lots of questions uh, and mention about the, the 50 Fathoms seems like a liquid acrylic, Forbin says. And that's, that's so interesting. It's nice seeing when a material is used that gives off a different effect. You could almost say that it looks like a Bakelite bezel. Absolutely. That's the effect they were trying to go with it. And uh, I find it, find it unique. Um, so the size divides people, BS says. I, I think so as well. 44 mils is pretty large. Uh, it, does, it makes it difficult to be an everyday wearer for some. Um, anyway. <laughs> Watch habit, my wife made lamb curry. Uh, don't worry about it, really. The stream is always going to be here for you to catch up. There's so much still on offer. We're on J, and we go all the way down to W. Oh, my goodness. There are so many still to go. I have to motor through these. This is just nuts. This is from Joseph. Beautiful Zin 556A. And the story behind this watch is that he was really trying to find a watch for him that would be a great everyday wearer that he could just use. And he looks at all the different brands and he settled on Zinn because he, he really thinks this to be a brand that hones in on the tool watch. And for that, you know, when you talk about a German inspired watch, you can see the Flieger elements. You can see that it looks like a field watch, very unique to the brand. I've said that Zinn uses contrast so well with their dials and uh, yeah, great, really nice looking watch. Nice seeing it on a strap. And he sent me another photo. He was waiting for the sauna to warm up. So he has a sauna in his place, which is just, Stella, as you can see the coals in the background. Check that view outside as well. That's awesome. It's really cool. I love it. It's nice seeing a bit of context behind the wrist shots everywhere in the world. People are sharing their watches with us. Okay, now we're getting to some more heavy hitters. And the next is going to be a perpetual calendar AP. And talking about leap years and everything, we will have a good look. A five-hour show, BS says. I don't think so. I'm going to try and tone it down. I can't believe we've been going for almost two hours at this point. Uh, the watches on show is just nuts. So I am going to have to flick through these a little bit faster. Um, so let's carry on. Julian sent me AP Perpetual Chrono, AP Perpetual Chronograph. <laughs> uh, I've got to pump the coffee. I think Julian is still in the chat. So talking about leap years and everything else, let's have a look. Where would we be able to find it? Me and reading dials. I am the worst. I don't even know where to start. But this is a very rare piece. We don't see this watch ever you know, and uh, interesting use of the dials and the placement. And AP was so well known for dress watches back in the day. And it's sad to see that they're only known now as brands that focus on the Royal Oak because, geez, they made some amazing stuff. And we will see some gorgeous photography. I think Julian and Fahim are buds because uh, Fahim also amazing photos. I think I must have, I think I met Julian before. Please, I have, Julian, I have met you before, right? Uh, it's a platinum from 2000. Superb, absolutely superb. And uh, look at these photos that he shared with us. Blue strap, 
heat blued hands, blue finish, blue dial. I would imagine it looks almost looks like an enamel dial. I could be wrong with that too, but uh, it's just beautiful. Look at that moon phase. The moon phase indicator actually jumps in and out. Very unique from the Trom 2000, like he says. Uh, this is it on his wrist. And the last shot, we get a nice close, and there's another one after this too. Get a nice close view of the dial. Look at that printing. Unreal. You know, the, the better the photography, the more macro the photography, the more we can see the little details. So talking about leap years, I don't even know how, I can't even read the dial. It says January 30th here. Is that the quarter? I don't know. This hasn't been, this obviously hasn't been set to, has it? Guys, help me out here. <laughs> I'm lost. <laughs> uh, I haven't had any coffee for the last hour, basically. Asking me if I can, if you can send on Instagram. Damien, please don't. Me, me and DMs on Instagram, I am absolutely terrible. Social media and me, I am the worst. Um, if you could send it to me via email, that would be superb. Email is so much clearer. I just get them sent in a row and I just save them right off the computer. It's really easy. On my phone, I'm absolutely useless. Not enamel, Julian says. Great. It's an awesome looking watch. And there's another beautiful close up. It's so cool. It's so nice seeing this variety of pieces. Uh, it's great. And Forbin's saying that Omar is beautiful. What color hands would you choose? Dark blue or properly blued hands on silver? I would say blued hands. Over, over painted blue, I would say blued hands. I think there's something very unique because when you have a painted hand, as we notice, the painted hand with its glass finish, it doesn't, it doesn't really play with the light as much as you would want, you know? But if you have a heat blued hand, since it is still steel, since it still has a sheen, it, it works like you would see a normal steel hand. It glistens, it shines, it plays with the light. And I'm all about light play. I love variety with a watch dial. That's one thing that really draws me to the design of a watch is seeing play of light. We notice how it plays with, with the various rings that surround the sub dials, uh, how every single gloss line is hit on the text. It's beautiful. There looks to be a different texture between the sub dial and the main dial. It's just stunning. That kind of stuff. When you see light play on a dial, that has me won over. Okay, motoring through. This is from Julie. If I'm not wrong, this is Julie Hill sending this. Black Bay 36. It's a really stellar watch. It's one of those pieces that you can enjoy, even if you are getting into the hobby. I said in the beginning that I'm not so much of a fan of, a, of Tudor as an entry-level watch, for my taste at least. But it's nice seeing this watch and uh, being worn as a 36. I do love the size and the presence. Uh, it's interesting because some people focus on this watch and get it prior to getting a 14270 or a 214270 Explorer. It's a great way to get into a brand, you know? And that's partially why Tudor has been so successful. It's almost as if most people who want to get a Rolex but can't afford a Rolex can grab a Tudor, enjoy the hell out of the watch, see if they really like it, and then make the commitment to buy something like a Rolex for themselves. Great video that I saw the other day. I can't remember the channel off the top of my head, but he bought himself a 214270 Explorer, and he, for the longest time, wore a Black Bay 36 prior to that time. Having the two watches side by side, really interesting to see the, the combination, uh, how they sit next to each other. Beautiful. Thank you for the submission, Julie. And next, K. Kyle. This is a gorgeous Grand Sega. He really captured this watch well in the light. This is the reference. <clears throat> SBGA375. <laughs> So it's a spring drive. Uh, it's, I don't know if it falls into the snowflake family. It just has a different dial layout. But it is stunning. It really is nice. Love the play on the light. Love that, that royal deep blue, you know, regality, that regal blue color that it has, how it plays and how it goes dark in certain colors, certain lights, sorry. Notice how the light plays on the actual power reserve. It's a different play of light. Grand Seiko, when you buy Grand Seiko, I think you buy them not only for the case designs, which I find fascinating, but also the dials and the spring drive, of course. Spring drive is cool. Uh, is this GSLE? I really don't know. I really, really don't know. Me and Grand Seiko, don't even ask me. Ask Craig, uh, Craig Ship. He knows much more about this stuff than me. <laughs> uh, okay, so let's carry on. Still lots to go. Now we get to Carassus, and now we get to the heavy stuff. Hold on. So we have 
I don't even, I don't, he sent me so many, I've actually struggled to recall them all. So this is an offshore, very early era offshore, if I'm not wrong. And he has sent me a few repeats. So let's see if I can try and read it on here. He sent me some stunning watches. You're going to see some great APs and a Vacheron and some Pateks, IWC in a second. So that should be good. We're going to get through them now. Jacob, thank you so much for the super chat and thank you for joining. Sorry that I'm taking so long with this. I need to speed up because, geez, it's been two hours already. I'm going to start motoring through as we get through this. Uh, but it's so nice seeing these pieces and the variety that we're being shown. Next from Carassus. I think this was from the previous week. Actually, hold on a second. Hold on. Uh, let's look. Okay. So he sent me, this is a first generation, if I'm not wrong. It's either a first generation or a second generation overseas. And you can see that they were slowly but surely starting to learn a thing or two, that bezel integration, the, the bracelet still hasn't received its its uh, crown, sorry, its uh, Maltese cross yet. Beautiful dial though, love it. It's like a, a very deep champagne and uh, it's gorgeous. Nice seeing the contrast. I think he sent me another one at a later stage. Let's keep going through. This is the offshore in a bit more detail. It really doesn't look like your typical AP offshore when you look at the dial and everything else. Uh, you notice that the emphasis has been pushed heavily onto the batons and the plots nowadays, where with these models, it's much more low key and understated. And the Damien asking only high watches. No, 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 we don't look at only high end watches. We look at everything from entry level to horterology. There is no bias. That's the fun. We get to really like hone in on, on just sheer development of watches in general. Beautiful piece, and who's uh, one of my favorite watches right there, William said. Very interesting piece. It's definitely not your typical offshore, and this I, I think this is one of the first generation offshore pieces, uh, but it's gorgeous. The blue on blue contrast, the, the white accents for the hands, stunning. Next. He was sharing here the, the five, 5402 and the 15300, two different references. This is the I'm sure he said, I'm sure it's the, the 202, the 5402. This is this reminds me of a jumbo. Might need to help me here. Is this a later, a, a very earlier version of the jumbo? I don't know. Uh, but the, I mean, we all know the, the 15300 as a reference. It's nice seeing them side by side. Notice the difference between the bezel, the proportions on the dial. I must say the way they use the batons on these original, you know, the vintage references, much more interesting to me than than the modern ones. I love that that extra stretch that they have. You know, uh, it's a two hand, meaning that it doesn't have a seconds, a central seconds. Interesting combination seeing the two, just how it has developed over time. Of course, the presence has gone up ever so slightly. Uh, the watch now has a clear case back, so you can see the movements. But for the most part, pretty much the same, Genta all the way through. Getting on to the next. So this is the 15300 on the wrist. I can't believe how many watches we have on show. It's almost like we could break this up into a part two, you know? Jeez. <laughs> uh, so uh, I hope you're all still enjoying it. I hope you're all still liking this, uh, this sharing of all of these pieces. Beautiful watch on wrist. This is a gray dial. This is a separate version. This is the 15400 gray dial on the wrist. And uh, I wonder what he's reading here. The something, the shell. Interesting. <laughs> oh, this is a, this is um, uh, Lord of the Flies. I can see Ralph. I can see James. Whoever hasn't read Lord of the Flies, do it quickly because it's a great book. Love this rhodium styled silver dial. Looks beautiful on the wrist. Stunning. How did I know that he was reading Lord of the Flies? Isn't that amazing? <laughs> uh, I read and then you see piggies. Oh, yeah, it's a it's a real classic. I love the book. Tells you a lot about things. Um, Beautiful dial. There's something about the silver dial. Now, as Rich Buddy says, best watch right there. I, th I think it's gorgeous, Rich. Um, the gray dial does something. It really ties in with the, the steel of the case and the polish and the sheen. Uh, it's by no means understated. I mean, look at it. It really stands out. But I, I love that that blend. Even the date window is matched. And I mean, how often do you see that nowadays? Beautiful. White and gray. So stealth. But uh, really stands out on this reference. Next. Another photo of the wrist of this piece. Still great. Love the blue contrast. Another one from Carassus. This is a Navi timer. Please help me here. Uh, I see the reference H34030. I need a bit of help here because me and Navi timers, I am useless. This looks to be a Rattrapont. Wow. Is it a Rattrapont or is it a flyback? 
because I see there's a separate pusher on the side here. This is stunning, you know, with rose with a gold finish, blue blue highlights. Be interested in knowing if uh, you could give me a bit more details on this piece because I really, me and and Navi Timers in general, I don't know much about them at all. Split second, orange hand serves. Thank you for that. Uh, yes, it's a flyback. Really interesting. Speaking of which, uh, we're going to be looking at an IWC Portuguese just now and just noticing the numerals on the dial, eerily reminiscent of the Portuguese layout. Stunning though. I love that blue. The thing when you when you squint your eyes and you look at that blue, the, the white contrast with the gold has that bluesy two-tone vibe, you know. Uh, love it. Really nice piece. Haven't ever looked at Navi Timers. I really need to do a video separately on it. Actually, I did the 765. Isn't technically a Navi Timer, but it's a chronograph from, from Breitling. Uh, I need to look at these pieces in more detail and learn a bit more over time. Another one from Carassus. This is an IWC reference 1828BA, circa, I'd imagine 1970s, uh, 1972. How cool is that cushion case? When do you ever see a watch like this? I love this. I mean, you you never know what you're going to get. It's such a uh, a varied selection of pieces coming through, and that's what I love. Uh, I'm again like you. I'm learning as we're going through. I'm learning at what's been sent. So uh, awesome. It's just great. So thank you, thank you all again, still for joining. For everyone who's still watching, this is superb. We're going to get to some great watches just now. Seamasters on a mesh bracelet. You have to wait for it. It's just gorgeous. Just sent to me today, actually. Love it. So this is a stunning piece, uh, very TV style. Uh, it looks almost identical to the, the CWC that we saw earlier, the, the W10 and the beautiful hands. Uh, it's typical IWC. You see these hands. Reminds me of the, the geophysic um, JLC that we know. Okay. And the, the typeface used on this is also something really nice. Again, I can't hold on these for too long because there's just so much. Another from Carassus. This is a 5711R. So rose gold, you couldn't tell in the dark, but it's got a brown dial. Uh, I've worn a 5712R in the past, and it is really a stellar piece. Uh, hype and everything put aside, they really are solid watches. And then rose gold, awesome. Beautiful photo as well. Look at that sunset. Oh, I love it. Love, love the sharing. It's the variety here is just insane. And then we get back onto the VC. Now we know a little bit more about it. Vacheron Constantin, I think there's a better photo that he sent. So it's the reference 42040A Salmon, 1996. That's when this watch was produced. So there's a bit more information about this piece. And I mean, the Salmon dial is something special, very unique. But I think this watch looks relatively dated compared to uh, the latest generations. I think it does look quite old school. Maybe that's down to the, the batons on the dial. I think the batons kind of age it a little bit. Makes it look more like a dress watch, actually. It, they look like Patek batons. How's that? Reminds me of a, of a Calatrava. <laughs> Interesting. Uh, beautiful layout, though. And I love the salmon dial. Very exciting. Okay, next. Another Vacheron. This is on the red. Same same watch. No, it's not. We haven't seen this yet. Jeepers. Grasses has sent me a lot. Vacheron. Another piece. 70s reference. Uh, 7397ST. Very similar to the IWC. I think that's what he liked about it. Uh, Mezzanine, thank you so much for joining. Absolute pleasure having you here. It's been insane. We've been going for a long, long time. I don't know how long the stream is going to carry on for. I'm sure it's going to go. It might even oops, might even hit three hours at this point. You know, looking at uh, the remainder of the list. I'm going to try and try and speed through this as much as possible now because I know you all have <laughs> things to do. Uh, this is from Casper next. Thank you so much, Carassus, for sending all of these through. I love your variety of stuff. Uh, from Casper, this is an Invicta. How, when do we ever see Invictas? Uh, it's a 270 with an ETA 2824. This has to be one of the most peculiar watches that we'll be seeing on the show. Uh, I do like the open work. I don't know what the opinion is around Invicta watches, but, uh, you know, interesting seeing that variety, a bit of diversity involved. And uh, what I do like is that it's actually skeletonized. Check that out. So we've got a skeletonized set around the base of the dial, where the dial is the movement itself. I don't know what everyone thinks about Invicta. I thought it was a Richard Mille, uh, Mr. Pitchell says. That's funny. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Uh, interesting, though. Never seen it before. Don't know anything about the reference. Uh, can't say the lugs do it for me much. The, the case actually reminds me of a Parmigiani. It looks almost exactly like a Parmigiani. No? 
uh, strange. Reminds me of that, that styling of theirs. So have to learn a bit more about these pieces. I don't know Invictus history or anything else. Quite hard to read, Thomas Benet says, yeah. And that's the problem. I mean, geez, when it comes to legibility, I think that's number one with any watch dial. You notice that you actually read by looking at the plots running around the outset. Might even be perspex on the inside. I have absolutely no idea. Next, from Kenneth. Check these out. These are some gorgeous watches he shares. So this is a GS SVGM221. This is a very sought after and, and loved GMT. I think many people consider this to be a perfect one watch for them. Um, love the, it's, it's, I don't know, it epitomizes Grand Seiko in many ways when you look at it. The, the cream dial, the use of the typeface that we see, the blued hands, Dauphine styled hands, sharpness. You know, look at the hands, how, how they look like they could really take a piece out of you. Um, it's a gorgeous looking watch. And I would say for someone who is interested in Grand Seiko, I think, as Orange Hand said, that is the Grand Seiko I would get. Very, very interesting. That is the smallest wrist I've ever seen, <laughs> Brandon. <laughs> Shame, man. No, I mean, we can't, we can't judge a person by the size of their wrists. That's like, I mean, it's, it's bad enough judging a person by the watch they have, but by the size of the wrist, that's just like next level. Uh, <laughs> oh, that was beautiful. Really nice looking watch. I love the photo. When, when they're super high res, we can get right in and see like, the saliva on the dial, it's just great. Look at that thing. I'd love to get more into Grand Seiko. I need to do a write-up about them one day. Focus more on Grand Seiko in the future. Next from Kenneth. This is from a friend of his. Now, please correct me if I'm wrong, but I'm, I'm guessing this is the reference 5107. And uh, look how different it plays in this light. Strange how, how bright and reflective it is. But I do like this reference. I really do like this reference. I think the, the crown guards make it a very unique piece. Even though many people don't like it, there's something about, I think we've looked at this reference in the last show as well. There's something about the form of how the lug integrates with the crown itself that I like, I find interesting. Um, just in general, the date complication being quite nice and big. Is it, I'm sure, no, it's probably a 5127. I really don't know. Someone has to correct me here because I do not know, uh, but it's a gorgeous watch. I love the light. Light play on this looks stunning. And you can't go wrong with one of these as a dress watch. Next, from Kenneth. This is his 1958 date just. And uh, we can tell it's, it's more of a vintage reference because we have a old school style crown. We have a smaller fluted bezel. It's nice seeing these watches get some wrist time, you know, these old pieces. It's just great. And I, I'm well aware that I'm missing a lot of your chats in the comment section. <laughs> so uh, I hope I hope I'm not missing too much, but uh, yeah, it's great. 5127, Julian says, thank you so much. Yeah, I was close. 5107. Looks cool though. I do really like this aesthetic. I would say even more than just the standard dress watch. I think the crown guards offer something quite unique and that that flow of the case, something special, very liquid. It's almost like a liquid organic stage they were going through back in the day. So 58 date just. Nice to see this thing on the wrist. You can see the just the sheer corrosion on the hands. I mean, it's insane just how corrosive a material like tritium is to a dial. And uh, this is nuts. Next from Kenneth. This is a Lunga annual calendar. Yeah, this is from a friend as well, a local friend. I didn't take the time to actually look up this reference. Is it a part of the Saxonia family? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe someone would correct me here. This is the only Lunga on the show, by the way. Um, but the batons, something really unique about this watch. On first impressions, you don't see it to be such a highly complicated piece, your artifact. It's gorgeous, right? You don't see it as a very highly complicated piece at first. And I think that's down to the, the, the slightness of the batons. Um, but I really don't know what this is. If it's, a, if it's a Saxonia line, I would imagine it's in the Saxonia line, but it doesn't say Saxomatic. So maybe it's a manual wind in the family. It's a Saxonia. Okay, Julian, thank you. Beautiful though. I just, I love the contrast. I said in the last stream as well that uh, complicated Lunga for me isn't my, my deal so much. I love Lunga when they have simplicity on their dials, like the datograph or just the 1815 but they keep the complexity to their movements when you turn the watch around. And there's mention, you want to see the rollover for the leap year, exactly. 
Uh, but this is probably, I think this is an annual. This is not a perpetual calendar. Correct me if I'm wrong. Um, generally, when you have a perpetual, you normally have the quarters somewhere on the dial, if I'm not wrong. And uh, that's gorgeous. Really stunning looking piece. You can never go wrong. Lunga, I want to do a separate stream. I was thinking the other day of doing a separate stream solely on Lunga and just appreciating what they offer. We can do that one of these days. Just the, the, the sheer drool-worthy elements. Beautiful photo, though. So thank you, Kenneth, for sending all of these to us. Now we get to some interesting pieces. As we, There have been some amazing pieces on the show so far, but now we get to some cool stuff. This comes in from Chris. He's based in Australia. Now this watch is 10 years old, and it's his pride and joy. That's what he basically worded it as. Check that out. Rose gold, full rose gold, black dial. I tell you, black dial with gold, it's so legible, actually. Notice the subdials. It's actually such a legible looking layout. Makes reading it fairly easy. I think to improve it ever so slightly, I would have made the hands black, just so that you could see that contrast a little bit better offset from the subdials. But I love it. And what I love even more, it's worn on the right wrist. We have another left hander. So great. Eric, thank you for joining. Don't worry about it. We've been We've been going for well over two hours at this point, and we still aren't finished. That's just the variety. I can't actually believe we've been able to stay on these pieces for so long, but the watches are gorgeous. So Christian, thank you so much for sending this in. And if I didn't say it already, it's a reference 116505, Everose, full. Uh, just beautiful. Really as a pride and joy collection watch. And if you have a tan, if you have quite a, a darker skin, this watch would blend in so nicely. I think for, for those of us who are quite white, <laughs> white-skinned, uh, it would stand out a lot, but with a with a beautiful brown. Oh, the finish is just so nice. I love when when a brand can actually hone in on details like highlighting the text in brown all over the dial. There's a great relationship between parts. Uh, if I had to do a little bit of a revision, I would have a look at the subdials in a bit more detail. But in general, love the rose gold finish. Next from Lee, the great escapement. We have you on board, Lee, and we have. Oh, here we go. So. If you're in the chats right now, check this out. Um, follow Lee or The Great Escapement on Instagram if you are on Instagram. And I'll link his channel right now. Let's see if I can do this right. Escapement. I really hope there is an, is there an E? Yes, there is. Okay. So he is a founder of Red Bar in Manchester. Not Manchester in the United States. Manchester in the UK. And look at this watch. This was brought to his Red Bar event that he was hosting. I think he's still in the chat. I don't know if he's here. But, uh, oh, it's a, such a sweet spot watch. I just love it to death. I love this. And this watch looks brand spanking new, and it just makes me cry. Look at the condition. What I love about the 1655, actually, with most of these references, is that you can find so many new old stock references of these pieces because they just weren't popular back in the day. And because of that, you can get some stellar, stellar examples, as uh, James will tell you all in the chat, because uh, he has like three of them. I can't wait to get hands-on time with him, James. That can't come soon enough, honestly. Beautiful watch. I just, you know, I love that 70s-inspired motif, love the hands, love the, love the layout. So unique and strange and bizarre. Next watch. I can't stay on this too long, but it is just beautiful. Follow The Great Escapement on Instagram if you haven't seen it already. Um, really clean looking piece. I like seeing, as mentioned, that it does look, they look so good beaten up. Eric, they actually do. These watches, explorers in general, I truly believe they're watches that deserve to be scratched to, to hell. Uh, explorer 1s, Explorer 2s, in general, they need to be watches that have been worn compared to watches like Submariners and the rest, which, I don't know, have a better... Clive actually has a very good point about the sports watch. If you don't mind me quoting you, Clive, since you're in the chat, welcome to the show, by the way, uh, that a sports watch is a watch that can take a scratch and still look good. Very well said. I think that's the perfect way of explaining it. Uh, a sports watch is one that you can wear, use. If it's scratch and, scratched and destroyed, still looks great on the wrist, you're wearing a sports watch. And there are, many ver there are many versions of watches that can do that. The Explorer, especially for me, this line deserves to either look mint or used Works great in both ways. Gorgeous photo. Thank you so much for sending this in, Lee. Next, hold on to your hats, everyone. 5508 Submariner, and I think there's a better image. Let's just get a bit of a closer look on the dial. Again, Red Bar event in Manchester. 
5508, a very influential reference to the Submariner. It, it, uh, if I remember right, I might not know my history that well, but it incorporated the Mercedes hand for the first time and Submariner on the dial. I think it was a very important watch in that field. Very unique. And I think it measured 37 mils, very flat, very much a dress watch. Let's get to a bit of a better res. There we go. Gorgeous looking piece. Another great condition model. Uh, this is the Submariner. And I really like a watch that you can wear and say, I am wearing the Submariner. You know, this we could say is the Submariner because of its age and the fact that it's uh, so unique. I love, I love thinking that at this time when Rolex was developing this watch, there was no thinking about sports watches. They didn't know what constituted a sports watch. And they were playing around with scale and proportions and integrated bracelets for the first time. And I love the fact that this watch is much more of a dress watch than a sports watch when you look at it. And uh, it was supposed to be a watch that doubled up for formal occasions and to be worn more on formal occasions than just in the water. Really cool. So this has 100 meters. So this is, this is pre-Big Crown. Hey, this is old, old as. Speaking of which, I have a video on the Big Crown coming out very soon. Go into the history a little bit more. Uh, when the Big Crown was introduced, the James Bond that we know, uh, it got 200 meters of water rating for the first time. And it just slowly but surely improved. You know, uh, love it. Love the thin profile. Look at the quality of the riveted bracelet. Nicely intact. Uh, James does say it does. It looks like it has been polished. I'm sure it has been. I mean, this bezel. Do, you, do we really think this bezel is brand? I mean, you can see the pip. This bezel is also aftermarket. Uh, the dial still looks intact. Maybe the hands have been replaced over time. But it's just so nice seeing the watch of this size. I mean, look at it. It's just stellar. It's a real sleeper for sure. Um, okay. Meters to first dial for the euro, Eric Bell says. Thank you for that. Very interesting. Okay, next from Les. Now check this out. Talking about 1655s, this is an Incipio. Now I've been wearing, as if you might have, if you joined the show from the beginning, you saw that I was wearing a 1655 homage. This is probably one of the best 165 homages you can get. It uses an ETA, Swiss movement. And uh, again, talking about 1655s, it's amazing that these all lined up. There is an original and there is a homage. And uh, I really, I find the 1655 a watch that you can enjoy and play around with because no one knows what it is, really, unless you are a true enthusiast. Hell, I'd love to drop 20 grand on a 1655 right now, but uh, to be able to get that experience out of it too, just enjoy the dial and the layout and everything, I think it's acceptable. Great homage watch, as Thomas says. I think it's interesting, very unique. Next, Matt, watch this. Oh, yes. Now, this gentleman... Matt sent us the Zodiac Seawolf last week, if you watched the first show. And this week he sent us Seamaster on a gorgeous shark mesh bracelet. And this thing just kills it. Look at the quality of this photo first off. I mean, super high res, but look at it on the shark mesh. I don't know if I can, let me try and manipulate the screen a little bit so you can get a close up view of it. Let's see. It's so nice seeing this watch on a mesh. I've never seen it before. And dare I say, I think it looks better than the James Bond version on a mesh <laughs> because the black dial just seems to sit so nicely with the bezel and everything. Great visual contrast we have there. Seldom that you see Omegas on shark meshes, but we will see from Thomas Burnett just now that that's not always the case. Uh, beautiful watch. I mean, the Seamaster, I think I made a video on it this week, didn't I? I don't know. Spoke about it being a mid sized watch and everything else. But uh, this combination, this should be paid more attention to. Anyone in the in the comments or watching the show, find yourself a great high quality. You can see this is not your generic shark mesh. This looks like quite the heavy duty one. Maybe this was from a certain brand, but it looks so good. I would even say that this watch looks better on the shark mesh than the original bracelet. Can I say that? I don't know, I just did. <laughs> it looks so cool. Uh, a really nice blend of modern and vintage. I think what they've done with this watch is exciting. Not so much of a fan of this, like most of us have said, but I think it's part of this, the SMP character at this point in time. Mesh bracelet, beautiful photo. Matt, we stayed on your Zodiac for such a long time, and actually you inspired me to make a Zodiac video this week. So thank you for your photos, Matt. Your watches are stellar. Great taste in pieces. Gorgeous. Next, Michael. 
Michael sent me a nice selection of watches and uh, he gave me a description of each one, I think, but you know, running through this was, these were sent in today. So I had to kind of run through them quickly. JLC, meteorite dial, looks like it's a annual calendar. How often do we see this piece? And it's, I would say it's a, ma it's a master control something or other, right? Uh, beautiful though. And talking about uh, uh, meteorite dials, for someone who ever asked me that question in the beginning, uh, watch habit, I think. You asked me the question. Did you? Yes, you did. Watch habit. You just bought one of these. You just bought a meteorite dial piece. Um, look at that fingerprint that it leaves. That's what I love about the meteorite, as I said in the beginning. Uh, unique to the watch, unique to the dial. You'll only get one version of this because of how it's cut. And it's a very interesting grain. This would play so, so nicely in the light. Beautiful. I love the variety. Like I've said, I hope you've enjoyed seeing the, the sheer variety on the show today. This is from Michael as well. This is a, just a standard black GMT ceramic that we know is uh, very sought after and people really want to get their hands on because it's been discontinued. This is going towards his son. I think his son was born and this was a watch to commemorate his son's birth. This is going to be his son's watch one day, I think. Uh, beautiful piece. I love the green. Very subtle use of green accents on it. Uh, and of course, as we know, people are going nuts trying to get these pieces. And I'm watching the chat as I'm going, so I hope you're all enjoying it. I'm trying to like treat this more of a presentation and less addressing the chat, but <laughs> you know, try my best here, everyone. A beautiful piece. I love the photos. They're so nice. Next, check this out. This this really caught my attention. Two tone Daytona modern. So I guess it's a one one six five two zero, but an all gold dial. It looks so good. All gold dial with a gold bezel. And uh, what a combination. When do you, I've, I don't think I've ever seen one of these pieces. Correct me if I'm wrong. Are these popular? Are these common? Because I find it quite enticing as a combination. Seeing, seeing that not so much contrast, but seeing that marriage between the bezel and the dial, that relationship. Anyway, I need to catch up with you in the chats. I see people saying awesome awesome GMT, nice excuse to buy a watch. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> when your son's born, <laughs> very good VS. I agree, any good occasion should be celebrated. I think it's important, you know? Um, so it's just, it's just great, a very interesting watch. And the bezel does look silver, but it is gold. If we zoom in, if we zoom in over here in the corner, I, th I think I noticed quite a difference between the, the steel of the case and the gold of the bezel. Correct me if I'm wrong. What I'm going to do is I'm going to refresh the stream on my laptop here because it looks like I'm lagging behind a bit. But I hope you're seeing this all okay. Oh, looks good, right? Um, really enjoy that idea. And for me, the two-tone Daytona, um, the ones that are awarded at Daytona with a white dial, it's the one Daytona that I just adore. Uh, it's the one watch that I really think epitomizes the Daytona, for me at least. Two-tone Daytona with a white dial. I would go for any day of the week. Stunning, oh, great seeing these pieces, I love it. So Michael, again, thank you for this. Next one from Michael, check it out. Vacheron Patrimony. And I remember him telling me that this was a watch that he bought to celebrate a business venture, something, a successful business movement, whatever it was, I can't remember the, the depths of it, but it was another piece to commemorate an event. Love it. Patrimony, no date, no externals, just pure dress watch. Gorgeous. And uh, Turkey Vulture, nice having you here. There's so many names. I haven't even called you out as the show went by, but uh, it's great having you. Thank you all so much for joining. And uh, I hope I hope Rich Buddy is watching because I know Rich Buddy has been looking at Vacheron a lot and uh, beautiful piece. Something about the way they do their, their, their quarters, these tiny little slivets of triangles cut out, looks stunning. Very sharp pointed hands. I mean, this is classic as it gets, right? Maltese cross following through, like, like as uh, Forbin Colossus says, gorgeous looking piece. The size is also great, modern, contemporary. You can't go wrong with a patrimony. I think it's one of those unique pieces to the family. It's great to see that they still very much keep to their traditional motifs, like the, the very, very pointed hand set. Looks great. And this relationship where you see how the hand reaches, check this out, how the hand reaches the minute track, each separate plot, and then you get to the hour hand and you see how it just touches the baton. Space allocation is so important with watches. More brands need to look at it, you know? Uh, great.
Thank you for that, Michael. And next, last but not least, check this out. Would we believe we've got a code 1159 on the show, people. And uh, this, is, this was a gift to Michael from his wife. As a chronograph, this watch looks pretty stellar. Okay, it's great. And David Coffey just picked up at 1921. Oh, congratulations, Dave. We are loving your loom shots, by the way. They are stellar. Thank you so much for sending it through. Uh, checked out your Seamaster. Love that, that blue, uh, blue-green combo. Would you believe that the code 1159 was actually shown on the show? Watch of a brave man, <laughs> Pilot Style says. Yeah, I mean, it's it's a watch that has been shrouded in debate. And uh, some people say it looks like something made by Hugo Boss. They were onto something with this piece, definitely. The movement, the development, <laughs> code 1159 submission, brave, not Beaver says, it's funny. Um, they were on the right track with the movement and the development. I just think the dial needed a little bit more of a touch. Uh, but BS, as it was, if I'm not wrong, it was an anniversary gift from his wife, I think. I don't remember the, the full extent of the email, but um, beautiful piece. Uh, I do like certain elements to it. Not all, but I do appreciate that they've really tried to step out of their comfort zone. But <laughs> uh, shame. They haven't had many good, successful moments with this. But of course, you know, times could change. You might find this becomes a very sought after watch in the future. Who knows? The chrono looks great. My, my favorite in this line is the perpetual calendar. I love the full complication on this reference. I think the use, the use of the full dial with all the subdials would look superb. It's great seeing this watch in the flesh, though, right? And hope you got it for a huge discount. I'm sure that happened, Richard Rosa. Great point. Next, from Mike B. Yachtmaster, blue dial. Don't need to say much about this reference. Platinum bezel. Uh, this is a real sleeper. These yacht masters, I think, should be looked at more thoroughly. You're getting such a lot of watch for the money you're spending. Throw the steel sports out of the way and look at these pieces in more detail. Getting a platinum bezel, a beautiful blue burst on the dial, red accents with the hands and with the with the text on the dial. It's beautiful. It's it's really a dressy watch. It's very, it's it's like when you take a Submariner and a Daytona and you marry them together, you have highly polished case. Uh, much more of a dress appeal than a sports appeal, you know? But uh, I really think the Yacht Master should be looked at more. We've looked at a few earlier. There was a gorgeous uh, brown brown dial in an earlier stage. Stunning watch. And Mike, thank you so much for this piece. We are now moving to N. And we've got a few more. I think this show might be a three-hour one. We might actually close off at three hours at this point in time. Who knows? Beautiful looking watch. And I'm going to catch up with the chats now. This is from Nemja. I hope I get your name, Nemanja, sorry. Uh, this is a 2001 Seamaster Professional, classic, old school, really good condition. Nice seeing some, some vintage flair in there as well. Uh, let's see what else is going on. Just talking about different watches, it's great. I'm glad that there's some engagement going on here with pieces. Future classic, as Eric Bell says, I think, uh, I think that Yacht Master is definitely gonna be a future classic. Um, there's something about the the smaller sizes. I love the 37 mil yacht master for some reason. Uh, there's this little bit of a, sl a slimmer scale. I think I, I I think back to Charlie Sheen and the 35 mil yacht master that he wore um, in uh, Two and a Half Men. Something very classy about that dress. Understated nature of the piece. So what do we need to say about the Seamaster Professional, the original from 2001? So we're talking. Uh, Tomorrow Never Dies, was that the film? What was it called? No, Die Another Day was the film. I would imagine this watch is around that same time period. That's when it was released. And speaking of James Bond, there's going to be a great James Bond video coming out this week, actually. I think I might put it up on Thursday. Uh, talking about whether he should be a Rolex or an Omega wearer. And we go into depth. I think it's a 10-minute video, and we go through all of his antics wearing Rolex, through Daytonas, through... Uh, oh, it's, it's a great video. I really enjoyed putting it together. And you're going to enjoy it too. Uh, it's nice seeing such a, a variety of things. I question whether the 1016 is a watch that he should wear and uh, the Railmaster as an example and superb. I'm very on the fence with the idea of whether he should be a Rolex or an Omega wearer. I fully agree that the 1016 is a piece that that he should be wearing because it's just what was written in the books. It's what Fleming was wearing at the time. Great. But it's amazing seeing the development. I'll save it for the video, but trust me, it's it's a good one. It's a very non-biased discussion of how the brands have evolved over time, how both 
Rolex and Omega have parted ways with regards to how they've created their watches. And uh, Omega has picked up the, the flag of being the tool watch, the sports-oriented watch, where Rolex has this more regality factor behind it. It's a really cool discussion. I hope you enjoy it. It should be out on Thursday. So what we need to say about the Seamaster, very divisive with its hands. They call these James Bond hands, apparently. Uh, skeleton sword hands, don't understand. Black dial, unique watch, interesting. I think the bracelet dates it ever so slightly, but it is a watch of its time, 2001 variant. So thank you, Nemanja. I hope I got your name right. If I didn't, I really apologize. And uh, here's another submission from Njama. And this piece is a SWC USA blue dive watch. I have less than any idea of what this is about. Uh, I don't know the, the brand. I don't know the company. But it's an interesting use of the bezel. You see how the bezel has these little semicircular ring cuts through it. Yacht Master-esque, the fact that it's raised. But really, don't know much about this watch. It'd be nice to have a bit more information. Maybe if you're watching this show, you could comment or write an email to me about this piece. Uh, but anyway, oh, geez, we're getting to Neo at this point. If Neo is still in the chat, and then we get to end something. We're getting, we're getting to Orange Hand. There's some really good watches coming up next. Stick, stick around. You're going to see some great stuff. Next, from Neo. Oh, yes. Oops. We've got a Zenith Alfa Romeo, ladies and gentlemen. I don't know if I'm right with this, but this looks to be the 38 mil variant. Uh, and I say that because of the date window being offset. It's even got a racing strap. Neo is a legend. Neo is right there. There he is. Hi. Nice to have you here, Neo. You can't go wrong with this piece. The Alfa Romeo is one of those watches that really is the hitter. You know, the movement. The, the history behind the brand. It's one of those pieces that you pick up and you just know that you're buying a quality movement, quality watch. Love the dials. This photo especially shows you just how the dials play in the light, how you have this very, you know, rhodium kind of finish. We jump to a more flat, almost cream, gray, ceramic kind of finish, black, blue. Amazing. Look, the color contrast. Check out the, the little red accent on the second hand too. The use of these three colors, red, blue, black, and this, this brown, cream, gray, beautiful. And in the video that I did about the El Primero, highly suggest you watch it because I spoke about the movement for a solid like five minutes. I did some good research into the movement and learned about VPH and beat rates and just why this is so effective and uh, how it's so accurate. But I also spoke about the color and how these colors work so well together. I actually did a little chart showing red, blue, and black and everything together as a pairing. Beautiful. A watch of its time, but timeless. I wouldn't say this watch has been dated to the, the late 60s, 70s at this point. And there was a question about the Rake released Bud Owens. Yeah, I, we, we spoke about it. It's the, A, the A3818, I think. I haven't looked at it much. I've seen it all over social media. Come next week, we're going to have a look at those pieces, I think. I'm going to look back at the stream and check out what's been said and pull up some watches for next week's show and have a look at them in more detail. Um, personally, nothing beats the A384 for me. Uh, the blue dial is polarizing, where I think a panda dial is much more wearable on a daily basis. Uh, but I need to look at it in more detail. It's nice to see that Rake is actually starting to really grab the, the collaborative exercises. They're doing some good stuff. They've done a few. They've done, a, I think, one of the big ones with, with Zinn recently, if I'm not wrong. Nippon Man, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the super chat. It's a pleasure. Uh, I hope you're all still around because there is some great stuff still coming. Orange Hand, it's coming right now. And he's still in the chat. Great. End something. What did he send me? JLC Master Chrono. Can't go wrong with that. Just as, and it's actually superb that these two watches are side by side with each other because Val Primero and this JLC Master Chrono fall into the same category, almost bang on. Uh, with regards to just the price bracket, the quality for what you're getting for your money, everything in between. So in something, if you're still here, beautiful. And Ori, I see you've just commented, you're going to be up next. And Ori sent me a beautiful photo that we'll be seeing in a second. So this is stunning. Uh, JLC Master Chrono, can't go wrong. Both of these watches, side by side, I love that. I think, I think it just looks great. Orange Hand up next, as Discount says. Yeah, here we go. And Foreman Class is asking, imagine if El Primero had a red-white racing track around it. On, it, would look, it would look crazy. It would be way too aggressive, I think. Uh, referring back to the tin tin that we looked at earlier. Yeah, I think it would be a bit too flashy. 
honestly. Okay, orange hand. Now, getting to the more vintage stuff. We have a Yima Rally, and uh, there's an interesting name. I don't even know how to spell it, Amaryllis. So this is real late 60s, early 70s charm. Uh, I find the dials so interesting on this watch. We've seen this shared a couple of times, you know? Uh, Samuel, welcome to the show. I'm sure I've, I'm sure I got some of your, yes, you're coming up soon, Sam. Um, I'm sure I've seen this watch a few times before in the past. And if we zoom out and have a look at the dial, squint your eyes. This looks like a day of the dead mask. If you know what happens in Mexico city, this looks like a day of the dead mask. We see that the mouth and the eyes, it looks like a skull. Really, really interesting though. And, uh, it means yellow in Spanish, but Amaryllis, interesting. Very interesting. Or Yima. Yima means, I'm uh, sorry, I'm, I'm very backwards here. Uh, Yima is a great French brand, James says. Thank you. It looks like a robot, Discount said. Discount, I love the way you comment. Uh, I love the fact that you can like assign uh, a discount. It's so great. Discount is great. His comments are so, it's like what I would expect a designer to reply in a comment, you know, just straight up. You have to do a little bit of thinking behind what he says with his, uh, with his comments. It's great. Nice contrast, love the white, the black, the red, real vintage inspired, uh, one of those watches, a real watch of its time. Notice how the sub dials are like all wonky and crazy. It's like someone took this to Photoshop and just grabbed Liquify and just dragged it around and said, hey, whatever works. Next, speaking of Omega Speedmaster and Mark IIs, <clears throat> we have another, but this one is a little bit different. Orange hand, you beauty, look at this in the background, he's got his, Little explorer in the background hiding there. This Mark II, as you may know, the beginning of the show, thanks to uh, Steve. Was it Steve? Sorry, I'm just checking my uh, description. David, sorry. David's submission of the original uh, Mark II, that's that cover photo of the stream. This is the first Mark II, where the one that was submitted was a, uh, a reissue. This is the first edition. And you can tell for a few reasons. You can see that the racing dial is a little bit more defined. You can see that the orange hand is solid. It doesn't have any loom on it. There's no date window. This is the creme de la creme, Mark II right there, ladies and gentlemen. Stellar, stellar looking watch. I'm so glad to actually have both at the same time. We have both the reissue and the vintage on the same show. You guys didn't chat, did you? Because it's just nuts to think that <laughs> two people from two ends of the world both sent in a Mark II, but one is the original and one's the reissue. I love it. So thank you, Orange Hand, so much for the watches that you sent in. It's so great seeing this level of variety. Um, and just look at it. I think this watch is so defining. Highly suggest you watch the video that I did on it a week or two ago. Went into detail about the Alaska project and the history behind the watch. Uh, it was really nice getting a little bit more in depth with some history, historical discussion. But it's beautiful. Absolutely stunning. Next up is Ori. Now, Ori is in the chat. He seems to have been here for a while. And it's a pleasure, Orange Hand, really. You can't go wrong with this piece. I think it's stellar. I feel like another, like I said in the beginning, when you have a little bit of influence on this platform, it's very dangerous because you can just draw so many people to brands. <laughs> and I feel like the Mark II, there was a great comment on the video saying, shh, stop, stop trying to promote this watch because of its, you know, it's such a great sleeper and that no one should know about it, you know? Great. Thank you for this. Ori next. How cool is this? First from him is a Black Bay. Uh, is it a 58? Black Bay 58 on a Bond RAF style strap. How can you go wrong with this? This is, this is basically your modern incarnation of a Bond watch right there. Hey, very interesting. I like that blend. You've got the big crown, you've got the red triangle, you've got the gilt dial, and you've got the Bond strap to go with it. I would imagine this is a Zulu diver strap. Don't know. Ori, if you're still in the chat, it'd be nice to know from you. But you can't go wrong with this. I think a combo like this is just, it's cool. Richard Rhodes says it, cool. It's just slick, understated. Uh, one of the best bang per buck pieces. Zane, I think you're right. Um, it's really one of those pieces, like I said earlier, it's one of those pieces that, that gets you into the hobby for sure. And it's a great value proposition for what you're getting. I just wish that the snowflake hand they would possibly phase out the snowflake hand on some models and just have pencil hands or have a snowflake dial fully. This dial set was only ever used on a very specific Canadian submariner uh, that was in the mill spec family many years ago. Anyway, beautiful watch. Next though, this is the real definer. I was, 
I was thinking to myself that this should be the, the watch to like have on the cover. Boom. It's so nice seeing this watch in the wild. Now, we had a bit of a back and forth, and he told me that he has a six six seven five inch wrist, so almost seven inches. But uh, there we go, two one four two seven zero. I mean, this is this could be a stream stopper right there. I love I love the composition, love the balance. It fits him like a dream, and it's just you know everyday wearer can't go wrong. You wake up in the morning, throw on this. I'm wearing a Rolex. I'm wearing an Explorer. That's me going out to explore. Watches and giggles. I ate dinner and I'm back. This stream really shouldn't have gone on for this long, but it has. We seem to be getting close to the end, though, which is great. <laughs> yeah, we're going to probably end off at the, th the three-hour mark, which is a nice change of pace. It's a little bit longer than usual, but I hope you've been enjoying it. The variety has been great. So I love this. Not only do I like the watch, I love the photo, the composition, the, the light and everything playing on it. Just look at it. You can't not appreciate this piece. Ah, Ori. You're a man. And the fact that you're in the airborne division, I noticed. Uh, my old man, he was in the uh, light infantry, and he was in the Rhodesian SAS. And they did some crazy, crazy stuff in the 70s, so that much. So I have great respect for men who throw themselves out of planes, I'll say that much. Um, my dad loved it. He did it for like seven years straight. I think he probably did, I don't know, well over 3,000 jumps when he was in the Rhodesian Bush War. And uh, he loved every minute of it. Kasavak Medic, long story. If you can help, I'm sure you'd appreciate the kudos, the super chat. You know, uh, guys, really, you don't have to. It's so I don't know what time it is in the world for you. <laughs> By all means, it's uh, it's quarter to one here in the UK. Silas Scouts, yep, Eric Bell. You know, you know a lot about the history. It's amazing. Uh, thank you again. I have to say to all of you watching, to all of you in the comments, thank you all so much for joining. And I haven't even started talking about this watch. This is from Paul, 39 millimeter, Oyster Perpetual, reference 114300. And he loves this piece. He says, of all the watches that he has, this one is something that really catches his attention because of that dial, that uh, beautiful finish, the way that it blends in with the, the finish of the, the case, the braces. And I, what I love about the Oyster Perpetuals, actually more than the Explorer, can I say that? The Explorer with its flat bezel, doesn't appeal to me anywhere near as much as the domed bezel of the Oyster Perpetual. I would love to see an Explorer with a domed bezel. Uh, and what, why I say that is because visually, what the domed bezel does is pull in the light around it. You notice his hand is, is being curved over here at the base. And since it does pull in the light, it brings down the visual presence of the watch ever so slightly. Uh, so with this piece, you can see that it has quite a lot of presence. It's very much all dial. And with a rounded domed bezel, I think it would tighten up the overall finish. I hope you get to see that a little bit better in this image. Beautiful watch. These pieces are gorgeous. And dear artifact, I think we have very similar tastes. Um, it's great. I mean, I love, we, we both are very much fans of vintage reissue pieces and homage watches of various kinds, and it's awesome. Uh, Former glasses, love the dark rhodium. It's nice, and and the, the highlights of the blue is also great. The oyster perpetual lines, there's some great references. I also think you need to keep your eyes out and your eyes peeled for the fully loomed versions of these oyster perpetuals because they are excellent value for money. And uh, yeah, love great combination. This is from Reed. Now Reed sends in some stunning photos, and I think he's only sent in one two tone date just on an oyster with a silver dial. And Reed sent in some great stuff last week. Seika, Alpinist, what else did he send? Jeez, I can't even remember. Beautiful, though. Love, I really like this combination, actually, looking at it now. Seeing the gold highlight next to the, the silver burst champagne finish looks great. Really is nice. Great amount of presence. Uh, you can't go wrong with a date just. I really look forward to writing about the date just in more detail and focusing on how important it was to the development of watch making. And the, the rotating date window is so important. So uh, awesome. Reed, thank you. You always send some amazing photos through and thank you so much for this. It's so nice seeing the level of variety. Next from Renee, we're getting close to the end. We have, I would say about 15 more people and then that's us. Sweet, let's go. Renee sends in a Fortis. This was from last week and I didn't get to it because I missed Somewhere along the lines, I missed the uh, the video or the, the image that came through. Uh, 
Uh, just catching up with you in the chat. I hope to keep up. Um, RS has agreed on the bezel adjustment. It would be nice to see it incorporated in the 214. Don't know what it would look like, but it would be cool to see that adjustment. So Rene with the Fortis. This is a brand I need to look at more. Apparently, it's a very good entry-level brand to get into watches in general. Uh, and I'd love to see a bit more details on it, uh, talking about both. I think comparing Zinn and Fortis would be quite a nice comparison. And uh, the real space station watch, Eric Bell. Was this a watch that actually went up? That would be interesting to know. ISS satellite. I'd like to know a little bit more about that. Do you need to learn about these pieces? They're big on their Flieger-inspired elements. Okay, getting through. I want to try and have as close to three hours as possible. I'm going to try and run through these. This is from Richard, and this was from last week. And if I'm not wrong, this is Freddie Turner. <laughs> Freddie Turner is in the chat. I think he is. Uh, beautiful Retropont. Not Retropont, sorry. Uh, 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 retrograde Breguet. 5207. If I was going for a Breguet right now, this would be the one for me. 5207 for the retrograde seconds. Basically, what happens is this is the subdial. As it ticks, it hits the 60, it jumps back to naught. You have a giant, giant power reserve at the top. And I love that balance between the top and the base. Looks so good. Really Breguet all the way through with its with its use of asymmetry, but also balance. Uh, real pocket watch. And behind him, it looks like there's also a French mantelpiece clock. Love it. He sent in some great pieces. Let's have a look at these now. A Deville, 18 karat chrono. Something special about this Omega Deville, it's a 321. And uh, very, very sleeper, underrated, awesome. I love it. When you can find an Amiga like this, they're, they're still out there. I think this is from the 60s, 60s era. Uh, when you can find an Amiga like this that has a 321 that everyone loves, and uh, it's just great. So really awesome piece. I think this is a winner. And I uh, love the composition. Nice seeing that he's driving his BM. Next, from Freddy. And this is the real heavy hitter. We've had a... CWC W10 on the show. Now we have a Smith's W10. This is a legitimate Smith's W10, not an homage to Smith's. We've had a two Smith's today. How cool is that? We had a look at the Everest. Now we've gone to an original Smith's. The way you can tell very easily is that you can see the tritium on the dial, of course, but then made in England. The way you can tell with the, the reissue now is that it says Great Britain on it instead of made in England. But this is an original from the 60s. I would say 68-ish. And I mean, how can you go wrong with this piece? Absolutely stunning. You notice that it doesn't have fixed spring bars. Freddie's wearing it at the moment. Oh, it's just awesome. Love the photo as well. Thank you so much for sharing with us. Uh, the fact that it doesn't have fixed spring bars, you can actually get rid of uh, the, the spring bars and replace it with a leather strap. And just look at it. This could be the perfect James Bond watch, actually, considering considering uh, the past and what it has been used for and its its life. Oh, it's such a sleeper. It's a real sleeper watch. And you can get them. They're still available going on to places like eBay. Uh, they are still very easily to, easy to find. Uh, you will be paying quite a lot of money for them. The movements are stellar. It's a real hard, hard-wearing piece. Uh, could take a great hit. And last but not least, Longines Heritage Classic. Now, this watch I've done a video on. I actually prepared it on Friday. And oh, it's, it's one of those pieces. I, I said in the video straight up that I believe it to be one of the greatest sector dial watches ever made in recent times, uh, just because of the way it's been handled with regards to its proportions, uh, use of color, use of lines, lines being used everywhere around the piece. It's a real pilot's watch at this, at this stage. And I'm sure this will get a lot of attention. I hope to to get this seen by a lot of people when I put the video out somewhere. But they really are. I think, Bud, they really are um, pulling out the stops with the watches they make. Very underrated. This piece especially blew me away end of last year. I thought it was one of the best releases I've seen in a long time. From Longines, at least, I believe this to be one of the best from their heritage family. So I look forward to that video. That should be, I don't know, next week or the week after. Who knows? Next from Rob. This just doesn't stop. We just, we're still going. This is our number three we're getting to. We're still rolling. This is from Rob. Jack Daniels Distillery in Tennessee. I would imagine. Yes, Tennessee. Rocking a root beer. Bang. Boom. Done. <laughs> How cool is that? Drinking, drinking whiskey with root beer, with, with a root beer watch, I think is just it. No, that is just, that's just the way. It's what you have to do. 
I've said so many times, you've, if you've watched any of my shows before, this, uh, this watch is, is such a sleeper in the family. The colors, the combination, the wearability, two-tone, but subtle enough to be worn every day. Congratulations, Rob. Beautiful photo. I love the fact that it was taken at the Jack Daniels distillery. And uh, what can you say? Absolutely stunning. So uh, wear that in good health, because that's one hell of a piece. If I was going for a Rolex right now, actually, I would, uh, I would think about one of these pieces for myself. Of all the modern steel sports pieces out there at the moment, I think this one really does catch my attention the most because I just love that visual complexity that it has. And G saying, love this watch. You've just picked it up though, and hey, you've got one of these. You just, this is one of your earliest purchases actually. Awesome. And Rob, this is you. Ah, oh, it's a pleasure. Such a gorgeous watch. I love it, love it. Thank you so much for sharing. Sam, next, 39 millimeter Longines Conquest. This watch doesn't get any attention in the space. And it looks like a stellar watch. It reminds me immediately of the Tudor, what is it, the Heritage? No, the Tudor Ranger. No, what the hell do they call it? The Tudor North Flag, that's it. <laughs> uh, it reminds me of the Tudor North Flag when you see the, the six and the 12, the balance. Now, if I remember right, he said that he'd looked all over the place for different pieces. And this one spoke to him the most. It's one of the most assuring experiences he's had with the watch he really enjoys this piece and it looks stunning i like this combination it's got some crown guards it's got an explorer-esque dial very very uh pilot inspired you would say stands out extremely well interesting nice combination you never see these pieces shared and it's great to see it looks like it has hollow end links or end links that are articulated so you can actually wear it a bit more comfortably 39 ish presence i would say 39 mils, 40 mils, great. Next, from Sam, I think. This is a different Sam, <laughs> I don't know. Uh, black Bear, another Black Bear. And I think this is also a 58. Uh, you know, can't go wrong with the Black Bear. I think it's using a, a Tudor NATO as well. Really cool, and I think this is another photo from him with a bit of, with a bit of water damage, as you can see. Uh, it's great seeing Tudors on NATO straps. I think these watches deserve NATOs for the most part. Uh, great for wearing. You know, these watches are made to be worn, and I think that's what makes uh, makes them so effective. Uh, Thomas, TikTok, don't stop, awesome stream. It's a pleasure, Thomas. I really hope you're feeling better and uh, rest up this weekend, brother. You're going to be up next here very soon, straight after S, so arrives the T. Looks like I've <laughs> made a mistake with the naming just now. It's funny. Uh, Forbin says, funny how root beer is preferred. Let's just try and get a bit closer so you can see something. Funny how root beer is preferred over the simple brown. Even the color's name is marketed. Yeah, it is. It's weird, huh? And it's crazy just how Rolex has been given, assigned so many nicknames by the community. Uh, it's nuts. It is just nuts. And uh, yeah, as we keep going, we're going to enjoy a few more pieces. There's still some great stuff coming. Thomas Burnett, I look forward to showing off your watch. You're going to, I love your photography, Thomas, is stellar. Talking about Omegas and uh, shark mesh straps. You're going to enjoy it. Uh, so it's great. And Oko Zen, thank you so much. It's, it's a great, I, th I think this is the first time we're really uh, experimenting with this idea, making it a bit more official. But it's it's great seeing just a sheer variety of watches sent in. And we're, we're celebrating what everyone is wearing, not what is being shown on the platform, you know, advertised to us, but more a, a deeper, a deeper like dig into what everyone else wears. You know, people in the comments section of a video, you want to know what Apple Joe, Joe Apple wears. We get to see it, so it's cool. Next, this is from Sam. I don't know which Sam this is. There's been lots of Sams sending this in. This is a Zin 857 GMT. And again, talking about Zin and the way they use line weight and contrast, I'd say they're one of the best in the business in the German space. And many people say that Zin is the real German tool watch. Uh, they make watches to be used and beaten around and I love that, that pilot aesthetic. Notice how we have UTC. So I'm guessing this is a military, military spec. Really interesting. Uh, you notice how the, the color scheme works and how you get to see the GMT hand on the inside. It doesn't get in the way of the hour hand and the minute hand. Really interesting. And the use of the line weights. Again, the heaviness of line weight is so important. Color and line weight, contrast. Zin screams toughness. As Ari says, yeah, I agree. Jojo Apple, Tom, <laughs> I'm losing my mind. You know, I've been doing this for three hours straight and uh, I can imagine the 
oxygen deprivation. Oops, oxygen. <clears throat> Oxygen deprivation and the voice is slowly but surely going. <laughs> Next, from Sean. Yes, we're just going to pull up a Patek Philippe because, you know, Patek 6000G with a blue dial. This is quite a divisive watch in the family. Not, no one knows where to really place it, but it's a Calatrava. It's got a bit of sports to it. It's got a bit of dress. Uh, very interesting use of numerals on the dial, balance. Bit of a roulette wheel placement. Uh, it's got a blue strap. Interesting composition of parts. I don't know how I feel about this watch so much. There are some people who are diehards. I would say this watch is very much a diehard wearing watch for someone who loves Patek and who wants something a little bit more adventurous, you know? Um, and like I said, when talking about that perpetual calendar on the stainless steel, I really appreciate Patek and any dress brand that uses a separate hand to highlight the date windows and everything. I find that such a more effective method for a dress watch. It really harkens back to vintage inspired elements and uh, it's just great. You get to see a lot more complexity on the dial instead of having it hidden behind windows. Uh, Paul, thank you so much. Such a pleasure, it really is. I've really enjoyed it too. I mean, I wouldn't be doing this for three hours if I <laughs> wasn't enjoying it. I said to myself that I would get through all of these watches. Next, beautiful watch, I love the contrast. Again, talking just after looking at Zinn with the white contrast, check how well this watch reads. When you look at it in general stellar gorgeous so thank you sean so much for this next now this name check out the watches check out this polar first time we've seen a five digit six digit reference rolex polar explorer in general we saw a couple of them in the last show this is the first one we've seen here so this comes from suave such a i probably butcher that terribly but uh, this is his username I just love it. The photo, the, the shirt that he's wearing, the jacket, the background. I don't even know what this background is. It looks like he's standing in front of an ice scape or something. I mean, you can't go wrong with a Polar Explorer 2. The modern one especially stands out and it really does. I mean, even looking, looking at it against the white background, how well does that read? You can see every little detail on that dial. Beautiful photo. So thank you so much, Suave, I'll call you. Uh, it's just great. And uh, it's amazing how we've been going and the stream is still going. We've now almost hit the three hour mark and we're gonna keep running. Okay, next. Have we really gone for three hours? I think I'm losing it. It's one o'clock in the UK. So yeah, we, we kind of have, <laughs> it is nuts. Okay, next, Tetley. If Tetley is in the chat, if he's here, he often is in the chats normally. This is a 1974 Omega Mega Quartz. Now, these were very important watches. These mega quartz movements were some of the most accurate quartz movements ever made. If I remember right, they were so accurate that they would just destroy battery life. And uh, I love it. Look at the photo. Look at the clash of colors and the contrast and the light. Lighting is everything in life, you know? Awesome. Another TV screen, as Eric Bell says. Yeah, I love it. And Sam, I'm not killing it. I'm killing myself doing this. You know, honestly, come Sunday, I'm passed out. I'm passed out for like most of the day. I get a I get a stream hangover most Sundays because these are like they, they take a lot of energy to do half the time, but it's just great. I love it. This is such a nice submission. I love the colors. I love the 70s motifs. Omega and their quartz watches back in the 70s. They really nailed it with what they did. Okay, next. Jumping over. So thank you so much for this, Tetley. Thank you for the submission. This is from Sriram, and this is a Zenith El Primero automatic. And it's crazy to think that we have looked at a El Primero tri tricolor, and now we're looking at a more dress-oriented El Primero automatic. And we've also looked at a JLC master chronometer, chronograph, sorry. They all have the same kind of aesthetic. I would imagine the movement in this is exactly the same as the tricolor. And this is beautiful. It really is nice. Zenith knows what they're doing. And one thing I really dig about Zenith is the use of the text on the dial. Absolutely gorgeous. I love that little bit of serif, a little bit of cursive, a little bit of balance. Nice. Use of triangles at the quarters, very interesting balance. You can't go wrong with the Zenith. I think it's just just stellar. Next up, thank you so much for the suggest for the submission. <laughs> and uh, next up is Thomas Burnett. And I hope he's still here. I don't know if he is, but this comes from everyone's favorite Thomas Burnett. This watch has just recently been serviced by Omega. It's a baby Ploprof. 
120 meter, and he fell in love with this watch. He, he'd really been looking at the Ploprof as a piece for himself, but the size and everything didn't really appeal to him as much. The baby Ploprof is such a sleeper. Gorgeous watch. I'm so, I'm so happy that he managed to pick one of these up because it is just a character of its time, but so well represented that it looks to be something fairly modern. When we think about the, the Amiga Mark II Speedmasters that we've been looking at, uh, 1655 GMT, I really think this combination looks modern enough that it could stand the test of time today. It's extremely legible, as Tom Austin says. It looks great. Orange highlight. Love the fully graduated bezel, the beautiful, beautiful numerals on the dial. Look at the condition. Really, I don't know what he takes his photos with, but holy Moses, look at the quality. Get right in there. So this has just been freshly serviced by Omega. I'm sure they just checked out the movement, gave it a good run through. <clears throat> but I mean, can't go wrong. Love the shark mesh bracelet, uh, the old school case. Talking about the Speedmaster Mark II, check those crown guards on it. I did a review of Thomas's collection. If you'd like to see it on the channel, uh, I called it something like ID Guy Reviews, Thomas Burnett's collection. He has a great selection of pieces. Omegas, Rolexes, not your typical pieces, which is what makes it so cool. Thank you, Thomas, for the submission. You're always here. You're a gent. I hope you're watching this. You're probably somewhere else. You're probably asleep by now, but uh, love it. Love it. Next, this is from Tarek, and it's an IWC Portuguese. We haven't seen, we've barely seen any IWC on the show. And uh, the Portuguese is a watch that I'd love to look at in more detail. I think the one thing that puts me off on the watch is the size. I think this watch measures, measures about 44 mils, but the Portuguese is a real classic. It's a real race timer. I'm sure it was used in nautical situations, if I'm not wrong. If I don't, I don't know if I'm getting my history lines crossed, but I need to study up on IWC a bit more. Most of the time I focus on their pilot watches and don't give their dress pieces enough love. But look at this photo, beautiful. Tarek, thank you so much for the submission as well. Uh, beautiful finish. Look at that silver, how it plays in the light. You really get to see the quality of printing when you have a look at these dials. That's stunning. And the balance is something really attractive about this piece too. You notice just how everything is so symmetrical, straight and in line. Ah, that's cool. Enjoy it. This is another photo from him, just a separate angle. Again, it looks like such a vintage chronograph. It looks like a real stopwatch you're wearing on your wrist. Thomas Burnett is still here. That's good. I hope you saw your, your watch on the show. I mean, we just looked at it a second ago. Oh, it's just so good. It's just so nice. I love that orange hand. And by the way, please mention in the chat what they did to the watch, Thomas. Did they just service the movement? Did they replace anything? Did they replace the crystal or something? Love to know. I'm sure most of us would like to, to hear from you. Um, beautiful watch. And I love the blue highlights as well on this IWC. The Portuguese needs a review, and I hope to discuss it. Uh, as time goes by. Time is of the essence. This is from Thomas, another Thomas, and last week he submitted photos of his Zin 556i. This is a very unique piece to the family. It's an anniversary edition and looks just beautiful. His photographs just do these watches justice. These have to be some of the best photographs on the show, on the stream. Uh, stunning. And he's taken a few, got a really nice focus in on the movement and uh, he has an Instagram handle, and I can't for the life of me remember it, but I will write it down. I hope to get some more photos from him in the latest, that later stage, come the following week when we do this again. But uh, beautiful photos. You really get a good idea of the effect that the light has on this rhodium finished dial. Absolutely beautiful. And there's a third one he sent through. There we go. I mean, it's gorgeous. This really does epitomize Zen, I think. I love, I love it when a dial is radially brushed like this. It gives it so much more visual complexity and even for such a simple piece it looks like something you could wear on a daily basis and enjoy because it plays with the light so well uh, and it has a little commemorative plaque here at the base 1961 to 2016. i don't know that the full history and the story behind this i didn't take time to read up but this is really i think of all the zins we've looked at this one speaks to me the most i really enjoy it so thank you again thomas for sending this through uh, i'd love to see more of your photos in the future just the way you present the lighting and the shutter speed and however you do this, the contrast, it looks terrific. Next, another Thomas, and it is of a planet ocean chronograph. Now we're getting to the heavy stuff. It's amazing. We've got four more people to go, four more photos to go, and we've done <laughs> three hours. How is that? It is insane. Uh, beautiful photo from Thomas. 
love this. Uh, this this watch really screams just heavy, heavy duty. It's like the modern Ploprof, you know? It's a diving chrono. How many diving chronos can you get? You can probably count them on your hands, really. You can imagine Blanc Pond does it. Uh, Omega is big with diving chronos. Uh, let's see, JLC. There are very few brands that really focus on it. But the Planet Ocean is, I think, a line that more people should pay attention to. It seems like a watch that's less polarizing than the, uh, the Seamaster Professional 300. And it's a lot more toned down. It seems like a much more of a modern direction that Omega has taken. And uh, yeah, I love it. Again, we've got orange highlights, orange accents. There's just something about this color that just works with everything. You can never go wrong with it. We've got orange on the hands. We've got orange on the dial, orange on the Seamaster. All applied numerals, applied logo. Beautiful watch. It's a real heavy duty piece. I'd imagine it's 44 mils. You really can take a hit, keep going. And I dig the diving chronograph. It's the real, it's the ultimate diver's watch. Uh, since you can do two things, you can time bottom time and you can time uh, the time of your dive in general. And uh, as you're surfacing, there's so many little bits and pieces. It'd be great to have a flyback diving chrono. Awesome. Great piece. So thank you, Thomas, for this. Next is from William, and this is actually the last watch of the show. That is superb. <laughs> I've had a time. So this is a 116000. He calls it white grape, I think, white wine. I think of it more like a champagne dial. I don't know how you would explain it, but it is. Look how beautiful this watch is in this light. How bright and expressive is that dial, okay? You really don't see that when you look at it through a, a window at a boutique. This really does show off its brilliance in this light. And again, look at that bezel. The domed bezel on this piece really says something about it. I love it. It really is nice. And this is a shot of it outside. But I think the real one that does it justice is this shot right here. Twin batons. You can say whether or not it's a, it's a scheme that you appreciate or not. Uh, but I think the twin batons does give the watch a bit of a different look. This is a I would imagine a 34 mil, maybe. I might be wrong here. Uh, but I just I think the dial is just so exciting. Amazing color and finish. And I love the green light in the background that's reflecting on the case and everything. Beautiful composition. Love the photo. William, you nailed it. This has been an insane stream, and I really hope you've all enjoyed it. Uh, well over three hours, and I cannot believe. But William, you're still here. <laughs> that is so cool. William is actually watching. Your, your name being the last on the list. It's a stellar watch to end off the show with. I just love that color. Beautiful. Really regal, you know? I think, I think one way you could, you could explain a, a Rolex in general is regality. They really know how to sit back and create that presence. I mean, there's a reason why the Rolex name is a crown. You know, it's based on regality in the first place. So it's just cool. Just cool. So everyone, this has been insane. Thank you so much for joining. Thank you to everyone who has submitted watches to the show. This has been a great session. I've, I mean, we've seen everything, anything and everything. I mean, I don't want to scroll all the way back up the list because then I'll just get into talking about them again. Uh, but I hope you've seen through this that as a community, we can share so much variety with the watches that we have. And for that reason, I just think it makes such an exciting series. I love, I love Wrist Shot Week. It makes me interested all the time because it really is like a Russian roulette. We don't know what's coming through. And I'd like to end with Ori's Explorer because I think it, this composition on the wrist in the sunlight looks beautiful. 39 mils. Thank you to everyone who has submitted. If you're still in the chats, if you're still here, uh, it's a pleasure. It's an absolute pleasure. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to slowly but surely somehow pull up the end of the show stream screen let's see and stop sharing my screen personally thank you all so much for joining i really hope you have enjoyed it of course if you are replaying this i uh, highly recommend if you would like to be a part of this you can email me your wrist shot and what i'll do is i'll be sure to tell you when wrist shot week happens it shouldn't be next weekend but maybe the week after we can do it again but it's a time where we get to appreciate each other's watches and the sheer variety that everyone has on offer. There's so much more to this hobby than just what is advertised to us through platforms and what is popular, quote unquote, deemed so popular. As we've seen, we've seen perpetual calendars, dress watches, sports watches, everything in between. 
so much variety in one space. And I think that's what makes it such a fun session. Not even me. I didn't even know it was coming up. because There was just so many submissions, you know. Um, thank you all so much for joining, really. And Thomas, I see a super chat from you. I mean, you're such a legend, Thomas. I really hope you're feeling better and are taking it easy. Take a few more days off. Drink lots of fluids, brother. That's all I can say. Flush out your system as much as possible. Oh, it's been awesome. You all have been great. Expect new videos next week. I'm going to slow down a bit next week. This this week has actually been really labor intensive, actually, uh, putting videos out. Come next week, I might do one or two. And there's some great videos coming out soon on Zodiac, Longines. So there's a bit more of a design discussion with one of the videos too. So yeah, you're going to see some variety. But I do need to put a f my feet back for a few days and uh, get my head out of the watch space. Because as you can imagine, talking about watches gets uh, gets a bit heavy. <laughs> So really, thank you all so much for joining. It's been an absolute pleasure. Have a superb end to your weekend. Uh, I really hope the signal has been good tonight because there has been a storm here in the South Coast. I look forward to seeing you in the next one. So wait, uh, the next video will be out on Tuesday. And yeah, enjoy your Sunday, wherever you are in the world. And see you soon. Cheers for now.